I do that to distinguish me from my father, who was Ralph Waldo. Oh, okay. And, uh, so that you have to have a William instead of Ralph W. Okay, this is August 26th, 1987. It must be. This is Joe Todd, an interview with Mr. Ralph William Treeman in Sepulpa, Oklahoma. Mr. Treeman, where were you born? I was born in Perry uh, just after World War II. One November eighteenth, nineteen nineteen. And who was your father? My dad was Ralph Waldo Treeman, who, uh, at the time of my birth, was in the feed and seed business in Perry. Although he had formerly been banker, uh, the Treeman family came. My grandfather Treeman made the run into. Uh, Perry in uh, 89 and staked a claim in the business section and then was instrumental along with Homer L. Um, with Hiram L. Boys in the establishment of the Farmers and Merchants Bank in Perry. My grandfather Treeman was the president of the bank and uh, he also, by the way, was one of the ten founding members of the State Bankers Association and on their plaque in their offices in Oklahoma City, his name is listed as one of the founders. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was in the bank. He, uh, father was an outstanding track man at OSU, which was then Oklahoma Agricultural Mechanical College, and set several records that uh, stood for several years. Some of them were ultimately, practically all of them were ultimately broken, but he was the fastest man supposedly west of the Mississippi River at that time. Uh, he also was, <laughs> according to his story, had his shoulder broken uh, playing football for OSU when they played the Carlisle Indian, and he tried to tackle um, the, the great uh, Jim, Thorpe. Jim Thorpe, and Jim broke his shoulder, and he spent the rest of the fall hunting ducks, shooting left-handed, which was our natural point. <laughs> uh, that's basically my father's history. Of course, I think you have my mother's history. Okay, as, now, uh, give me your mother's name. Mother's name prior to her marriage was Irene McCune. And then, of course, it was Irene McCune Treeman. And she was known uh, through the years there in Perry. Um, she was a civic leader, a longtime member of the, the library board, and involved in a great many other activities in the community. Um, when did you start school? Sir? When did you start the school? Oh, I, uh, when did I start the school? Yes, sir. Well, it must have been about 1925. Uh, I started young because of my uh, my age, my birthday, so I uh, was always fairly young in school. I finished high school mm -hmm. much younger than some of my And what, what was the name of the school? Perry High School. The Perry School System. Perry. I don't think we named the schools as individuals, and it was just all the Perry Primary, Elementary, and High School, if I remember. Uh, I really don't remember names of school. Now, was was it three separate buildings? Well, we went at the time, yes. We went three different buildings. Mm -hmm. Originally, we went down into where the primary grades were in the high school area. Then we went back out to the west side of town, which at that time was the junior high school, which had formerly B had been the high school. And we attended junior high there and then went back down into the newer buildings downtown, down towards the town, which is the present location in Perry now, where we attended high school. And um, the schools were, uh, as I remember, uh, there was a period while I was in school that the new, there were new buildings built. And I think when, we, when I went back to high school, it was in the new building then at that time. And what year did you graduate? I graduated from high school in 1937. Uh, it was the year we, I, I graduated the year um, we had an outstanding football team, <laughs> which was the we, we went undefeated that year, except that we did have to technically def uh, default on or, or forfeit three games because of an illegal player whose name was Clay Rook who played, came up from Texas and played. Hump Daniels, of course, was our coach at that time. And uh, anyone who played for Hump Daniels, played football for him, thought he was the greatest thing that had come along. 
But we did go undefeated and were scored on only once, which was by Enid in the game that we won by something like 21 to 6 or something like that. Did you win state that year? They, we, there was not a state championship. We won a mythical state championship and then played a postseason game against Henrietta, which was a real Donnie Brook and a fiasco as far as sportsmanship because everybody hit our coach and uh, guns were fired and it was almost a riot, but it was quite an event and we did win that game by two touchdowns. Say, so that was on Thanksgiving Day. You say guns were fired? What? You say? Oh yeah, yeah. Henrietta at that time was a coal mining town. They were very proud of their football mm -hmm. team, and they hated to admit that Perry could beat them. And we went down. We beat them thoroughly. There wasn't any doubt who was a better team, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, there was quite a bit of hard feeling on the part of Henrietta fans because it was played on their field, and they outnumbered. The coach was hit on the head with a with a yard marker, and I don't know how many stitches they took on his head at the, before the half. He did come back the second half. Coach Hunt Daniels was on the sideline the second half, but he did have he had kind of a bloody face and stitches in his head. And then at the end of the game, there were guns fired or a gun fired, and that sort of cooled the crowd off. They threw rocks at us all the way out of town. So <laughs> that was back in the days when it, I guess. All right, to be a little oh, yeah, that partisan. Was 30, 30. <laughs> I was in 37 and we won that, yeah. That was the 37 football, Perry and Maroons. I asked Coach Hunt Daniels later, after oh, after several years, if, if that was his best team. And he said, well, it certainly had won, won more, but he didn't consider it his best team. His best team was the team he had two years before that. And uh, I think he was probably correct. We had some also good boys, but. We, we, I mean, we won. We won. We beat Ponca City and Blackwell. I mean, not Blackwell, but Enid and, and Class and Oklahoma City B team and some teams that were good teams. What made the coach so good? What? That's a difficult question. I think Coach Coach Hunt Daniels had. I always felt that he probably would have made a good coach anywhere. He knew how to handle men, but primarily boys. Of course, we didn't have the hands-off policies you do now. He didn't mind hitting a guy in the head with a board, or not, not in the head with a board, but with a helmet. And he'd slap you on the hind end with a board. And he expected performance and didn't accept anything less than that. And uh, the guys that played for him had a tremendous respect for him as a person. And he lived up, he did what he, what he believed. He was an athlete himself. And for boys, he was unusual. I think there were other good coaches, but I don't think anybody ever coached there that I've known, and there have been some that I haven't. They, they measured up to his ability to get the most out of his boys. Uh, there was a fellow named Van Oy that came prior to Coach Hunt Daniels, who was a good coach, and I think uh, had a lot of those characteristics. But the coaches in those days weren't faced with restrictions that they are now. In other words, the coach now has, has got so many other things that he has to be concerned with when then his primary concern was teaching a guy how to play football and it, you played to win, period. And it's, it's awfully difficult to teach now with the, with the restrictions that are on the coach that has. I was going to ask, um, how did the depression of the 1930s affect Perry and you in school? or? Well, uh, the Depression was, was tough, and I, I've tried to explain it to my children, which is difficult. Uh, you can't tell them. Actually, during the Depression, most of us as, who grew up, and I was a growing up through the late 20s and through the 30s, I was maturing, uh, uh, you didn't feel the Depression because it didn't have the effect. You didn't, we didn't feel like we were poor. Uh, we were. I mean, uh, all families were limited. I, there, there were some who had income and, and money that was, was available, but most of us didn't. And, uh, but we didn't think of ourselves as being poor or deprived. Uh, we knew we had my mother for a good many years, and then this is more than two or three, had a daily budget of a dollar a day for food. And this was a family of four children and, and two adults. And she lived within that budget. Uh, of course, we had a garden. We never did have cows or things like that because we were city people. But we did have gardens in the summer, and Mother put up a lot of food. A lot of food was bought. Uh, uh, well, uh, vegetables and things were in season and canned. 
So there was a lot of preserving done, and the women did work hard to uh, to get to get reserves there, but that they could live within the budget. But, but I, we did not we did not think of ourselves as being deprived. No. Did the family still on the bank at this time? The bank went broke. The bank um, went under during the banking holidays, and this would have been about 1932. I'm not real sure. My grandmother. Freeman, who lived across the street from us, who was a major stockholder in the bank, of course lost all her savings in it. And she made no attempt to uh, salvage money. She said that it belonged to the people that, that had the money deposited, and so she went and, uh, she lost her, her total, all her assets in the failure of the bank. How did it affect the family before the failure and after the failure? Well, of course, with us, uh, my father was not in the bank at the time. So we did not, uh, we didn't feel suffering except that the family money, the money that my grandmother controlled, was lost. At one time, the family was a fairly well-to-do family. I mean, uh, up until the, 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 what you would call the banking crisis, why they, they were. It affected undoubtedly the way I had to go to college. When I went to college, I worked my way through. Uh, to getting getting a five dollar check from home was like a gift from heaven. Almost. And uh, there just wasn't the money there. Of course, my sister was uh, in college at the same time uh, for some of that period. And uh, she was not uh, able to make it as I was, so she probably received a little bit more. But both of us uh, had to, to make our own way as much as possible. Um, you started the college in 38? Yeah. Uh, I want to interject one thing in here that I'd, I'd like to put on record somewhere. Another fellow and I named Ed Tucker in the fall of 37, that was in the month of August, Ed through the summer had built a canoe and he was quite a, he was, his father had been a carpenter and Ed was very uh, capable of tools and I helped him and he had other guys that helped him but we kind of, but he was primarily responsible for building Canoe. We had talked for years, and I mean two or three years while we were, and Fred, Ed, Ed was a good friend of mine, about floating a river. So we decided to float the Arkansas River. And we put this canoe on the river at the mouth of Red Rock Creek one Sunday morning, bright and early, when the river was up about three foot and pretty wide, and we spent the next 17, 18 days on the Arkansas River, and we floated to Arkansas from sort of below Ponca City all the way to below Van Buren, Arkansas. And this was done when we, I think between us, our total reserves were less than $10. And it's a quite, a, it's just, it was, we had a very interesting time on the river. And we lived on the land and uh, we had some very interesting experiences with people on the river while we were doing this. And I, it, uh, it, I don't know whether it was written up by different papers that had picked it up, I think probably from Perry Daily Journal, mm -hmm. and so that there were notices of it. Uh, if we would go down the river, we would run into people of us along the river who had read about it and had more or less sort of looking for us. And, uh, two or three times we had people mention they'd read it in the Tulsa paper or in the Skokie paper that we would be coming out there. Mm -hmm. But it was quite an excursion in those days. That would have been, you know, 50 years ago, and that's... <laughs> <laughs> what, why'd you do it? What was the option? Well, we just wanted to. I mean, it was just because we had the canoe, we used Ed's canoe, and, and we wanted to do it. It was just, it was, we were outdoor people. We enjoyed the outdoor. We hunted and fished, and that was our recreation, and we just wanted to do it. It had no objective, and it kept a very poor record of, uh, except I did write a card home every day. That was the one promise that made my mother. So she did get a card every day. Not mailed every day, but uh, at least I did get one written to her. Uh, so you ended in Van Buren? Yeah, that's uh, basically where we came out. We went on below, but had to come back to Van Buren to get out. Now, now the next question, how'd you get back? Okay, well actually, Ed, Tuck Ed Tucker's father was a, a, a veteran of the Spanish-American War, and they had a, down around Wilberton, they had a Spanish-American War camp. And he came up and picked up the canoe to take to the camp. We never saw it again. Uh, I don't know whether Ed was supposed to get it back or not, but that was the last time we saw the canoe. It's when his father picked it up at, at uh, 
damn you we hitchhiked well, Ed rode with his father up somewhere, and I hitchhiked from Van Buren, Arkansas, back to Perry. <laughs> <laughs> First time I ever really hitchhiked in my life. And what was hitchhiking like in '37? Oh, I hitchhiked a lot in uh, in uh, in the '30s and the early '40s. Of course, I went to school, and I, I had two years at OSU, which was Oklahoma, it was A and M in those years. And I was in the School of Commerce there, and I was not really didn't feel I was cut out for commercial, and so. Commerce or accounting, and they found that out about Freeman. They they're pretty good talkers. <laughs> so you went to A and M, and what what did you study well, at A and M? Pardon? What did you study at A and M? I had I went to school of commerce, and uh, I've had two years in the school of commerce. I lived with uh, Jack St. Clair, who was. A very dear friend of mine. Uh, he was also a wrestler. He was in the he was a school of engineering. And uh, later, Jack uh, did very well for himself. Um, he served in World War II, and I believe came out of the war lieutenant colonel, and then went with the he was he was in the engineer corps, and then went with the U.S. Engineers, and was later um, district engineer for the Corps of Engineers for the state of Nebraska and had several recognitions up there as Outstanding Engineer of the Year for Nebraska and things like this. And he has uh, retired now and lives in the southeast part of the United States. But um, Jack and I roomed together uh, for the two years that I was at, uh, we batched. And this was typical of the way you went to school. We did our own cooking and and lived on, uh, in a rooming house. I was going to ask, where did you stay in Stillwater? Yeah, I uh, stayed with Mrs. Pounds, seems like the name was, on Elm Street. And it was a, she had, uh, she had all boys. She had about six or eight rooms, and they were all guys that batched. And uh, we cooked for ourselves and, and uh, did all our own housework and all this sort. I also worked uh, for the NYA administration as a janitor my first year, and then the second year I worked in a drugstore bar. What did you, what did you work for the NYA? I worked in the Commerce Building as a janitor, and uh, very limited. I think my pay was seventeen dollars and fifty cents a month, and this was for two hours work at least every evening, sweeping offices and in classrooms. How many students were working for the NYA? Pardon? How many students worked for the NYA? Well, there was a big bunch because there, for a long period there in the in the 37, 38, and 39, it was one of the few jobs that you could get without special having had special pull or uh, having known someone special. And uh, uh, of course, it uh, 1750 a month paid my room and some towards my board. Uh, of course, we got food from home, and I was close enough to Perry that. Uh, that my folks were over off and on, and then every time I needed something, I could hitchhike home. Uh, none of us had cars in those years. We all we walked. I didn't have a bicycle. I, I think it'd be considered it a little bit beneath you to ride a bicycle <laughs> to college. But then later, I went two years, and uh, during the summer, I worked my for my father in the elevator, scooping wheat and uh, this type of thing. And the average pay then was two dollars a day. That was considered a working wage. Was that in Perry? That was probably, yes, in Perry. Father had, a, had an elevator. He bought wheat. And I would work there. I also worked one summer um, for Mr. Kaiser, who lived north of town, had a thrashing machine, and worked on his thrashing machine crew. I'm not real sure what year. That was about the year I was about 16 years old. Yeah. And the pay there was $2 a day for work from sun up till sundown. I mean, from daylight when it got barely light till it was dark. And the pay was two dollars a day, which for a sixteen-year-old at that time was pretty good, yeah. pretty good deal. Did you know Dr. Bennett? Doctor. Dr. Bennett at Stillwater. Uh, I had met Dr. Bennett, and uh, I did not know him. No, I met him, uh, and the reason I met him was because uh, Jack St. Clair's aunt, who the fellow I room with, married a Bennett boy, and I was in their home two or three times when Dr. Bennett wasn't there primarily as a, as a 
going over with Jack, who felt Jack felt a little more. He felt accepted into the, the household mm -hmm. because his aunt had married one of the sons of Dr. Bennett. Uh, Dr. Bennett was a wonderful man. I, I, I didn't know him. I knew his reputation, and uh, I, I certainly believe that he was probably one of the great men in our history. Uh, now, of Oklahoma. when you were going to school, that's when they had the big billing program, isn't it? It hadn't actually started. They, they had done some, yes. Uh, I don't remember a great deal about it. Uh, they had built, <coughs> they had built a new. I won't attempt. I won't attempt to say because I don't remember that much. But they had built a couple of, of new buildings on the campus, a big new building, which huh. I'm sure are still used. They built Cordell Hall, didn't they? Yes, it, it was, was built. In yeah, thirty-nine. Yeah, right along that period. Huh? Because I went to OSU in yeah. '64 and stayed in Cordell Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was built as a dormitory then. I believe it was it. Wasn't it originally a girls' dormitory or not? It may have been. I don't know. I, I don't remember yeah, for sure. Of it's an office building now. Yeah, it seemed to me that originally it was. They had built. It seemed like an, it wasn't a, a, the the liberal arts building. I know I had speech classes in a new building. Yeah. But I'm up, to, and it was on north of uh, it was more west of the of where the uh, stadium is now in that area rather than. In that area, mm -hmm. and you went there two years. I went there two years, and then I went. Then I went up to Iowa State College, Iowa State University. Mm -hmm. Well, it was Iowa State College at the time I went to ISC. Still in commerce? No, I went up there primarily because I wanted to get in the school of forestry, and I I had been outdoors, and but that time OSU didn't have a school of forestry, and uh, so I went to Iowa State to get forestry. And of course, that involved uh, quite a transition for me from a little country town. I I would hitchhike up. I don't think, I don't believe my parents ever made the trip to Iowa State while I was in college. I think that the whole time I was there, I hitchhiked all the way. Uh, the second year I was up, another fellow from Perry, I think deciding that probably he could get a better job up there because we could make more money, came up, named Joe McClellan. He had been a student at the uh, University of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and he lived in Perry. He came up and lived in the same area. Well, we we had what we call the chateau that we lived in, which was below a business building. We furnished our own beds and dressers, and uh, our rent was cleaning up the business building each evening. So we got by pretty easily, and Joe moved into this area. There were about four of us that lived there, and we lived very inexpensively. And we had pretty good jobs as far as pay went, working for the Memorial Union, which uh, paid outside of it was outside of the the scale that the college paid. So we earned almost double, but we also worked double hard and worked double hours. How would you compare Ames to Stillwater? Well, I think they're very much on the same basis. I think they're both proud schools, and I think they should be. And what very, about the town? Kind of aims the town well, uh, again, I think you can compare them rather favorably. There, there's considerably alike. Uh, the town, the, bit, the, the, the true business districts of both towns is somewhat removed from the college. In other words, the business district is not in the college immediate area. Uh, the merchants are pretty much the same. Um, in uh, both places, uh, and I worked in the business district now. I worked at the old Tiger Drug Store, which was owned by Doc Brass in Stillwater, who was an old, old-time druggist and a, and a wonderful person. And he treated uh, everyone that worked like for him, all the college students, and he had seven or eight. Uh, Keith uh, Cummings, I can't remember. Keith, I, who was late, who is a judge now, or was down in the Muskogee area, worked for Doc Brass, and he was, I roomed with him at, at one towards the end of the second year that I was there. So how long did you go to uh, Iowa State? I was up there three and a half years. And did you get your degree in forestry? To get a degree, yes, uh, to okay. get a degree in forestry, which uh, for some of the commerce, things that were, some of the commerce course credits were transferable, some weren't. There was, they would accept any, OS uh, and M credit if it was in the field, but of course they couldn't accept accounting and some of, some of those other courses as 
support people. So what year did you graduate from? I graduated in the fall of 42. And uh, of course immediately I, it was, I graduated at the, 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 in, uh, compar in, as, as compared to uh, OSU, Iowa State was on a quarter system rather than a semester system. So I graduated at Christmas, just prior to Christmas, and uh, came back to Perry expecting to go to work for a, I had a job promise at an airport that was being built, which was, this of course was during the war, and it was an auxiliary airport. Uh, I took the job one day that afternoon, I got notice that I was to report to the Navy on New Year's Day, and the next morning I didn't go to work, so. <laughs> uh, New Year's Day of 43, I spent, uh, I was in Chicago, in Northwest University in their officer training program. Um, training program. Did you play uh, football in college? No, no. <coughs> I wanted to. I did try a little wrestling. And of course, John Devine, who's well known over the state at Perry, was my wrestling coach. I was never, uh, I was never a first string wrestler at Perry. I probably could have been if I'd have trained and tried a little bit harder. But uh, Ed Gallagher was still coaching at OSU, and he had been a very special friend of my father's. And uh, at one time, Ed asked, didn't ask me, he suggested I go out for wrestling over there. So I did go out and found out real quick that I was completely out of my class. And, so I didn't, after about a month of it, then having to work as much as I did at the time, it was just too much for me to handle. Did you attend the OU and A&M football games? Oh, sure, yeah. They were knocked down dragon. So the now, I, my father, of course, because of his track, see, Dad had a, a, a letter uh, to all sports. He had a open pass to all sports events at A&M. And Dad, there was never a strong, I used to say he'd get us up in the middle of the night and make us stand on bed and sprint and sing OSU. But <laughs> that's a little of an exaggeration. But, but he was, I mean, he was he was as staunch an Aggie as you could ever find. And he made every, every sporting event there, wrestling, basketball, football, anything that took place at OSU, he was interested in and went to. So from my youngest days, uh, I went to, in fact, I remember watching Little Rabbit Weller from Haskell uh, Institute defeat OS defeat uh, Lynn Waldorf football team with two touchdowns, both runs over 95 yards. And I mean, I, I, I had a background of sports. I'm much better versed in the sports prior to 40 than I am since mm -hmm. at, at OSU. Were the uh, OU and A&M football game a bigger rivalry as they are today? As the, was, was there a big rivalry? Oh, heavens, yes. and oh, oh, I always think, felt as an underdog again. Yeah. There, was a, there was a resentment. I don't know whether it was a resentment. It was an inferiority complex. Oh, man, I mean, they played the hardest football game. That, uh, I remember, I, I can't remember for sure, but it must have been about 1935. I remember two comments. My dad... Dad would go down into the into the dressing room after the ball games, and of course uh, he knew the football coaches. Uh, and, and I mean, he he would he just he just loved the sport. Uh, I forget who he talked to. I don't remember whether it was Cox. I don't remember who the coach was at this time. There was there was after Waldorf there was a series of coaches in there, and. Uh, Dad went down. OSU, uh, OU had beaten uh, beaten o, uh, beaten OSU uh, and M about two or three touchdowns. And uh, at the end of the game, before the end of the game, we went back to the goal line, and every man that came up to the line of scrimmage had a bloody face. I mean, this absolutely—I don't think there was a single one that didn't have. And I'm not sure, but I think this is the year that Ralph Foster uh, played maybe his last year at OSU. I'm not sure, but anyway. Dad went into the dressing room when he came out. The coach had told him. He made the comment afterwards. And the coach said, "Well, I never won a football game yet where the other team could make five yards on every down." So <laughs> I remember the comment: "If you want to win a ball game, make five yards on every down." That was about about the way the game had gone. But uh, I mean, Dad agonized when when 
and a and got beat by OU. I mean, that was the one. He'd, he'd rather beat OU than Nebraska. Or, of course, they didn't play Nebraska in those days, but anybody else that OSU played. He, that was back, you know, of course, OSU at that time was Missouri Valley, which right. was before it was before the Big Six and the Big Eight and all this other stuff. So tell me about training at Northwestern. Maybe. Well, of course, I was there. Jan I went in on January 1st. That was my first day of naval duty. And Northwestern University was a cold place. It was uh, it was right on the lake shore there in, in Lake Michigan, and the wind blew cold, and it was snowy. Uh, I don't know how they selected company officers. I never have figured it out, but I was one of the company officers. There were three company officers: a commander and two platoon commanders, and I was one of the platoon. Commanders. Uh, I, like I say, I don't know how I was selected. It may have been the fact that I had had previous ROTC training at, uh, at OSU. I had been in the infantry there. I tried to get in to advance at, at Iowa State, but uh, they wouldn't let me in because it was transferring from an infantry to artillery unit. And it may have been a good thing that I didn't because I'm quite sure it would have been involved in a lot of things that I didn't, wasn't acquainted with and those boys had two years head start. So I did then, while I was at Iowa State, I, uh, prior to the war breaking out, I had already enlisted in the V-6 program, uh, which was the Naval Reserve Program Officer Program. And they, at that time, I made application to get in prior to graduation. I wanted to get in way ahead of time, but they would not accept you until you had received your degree. I think they had so many officers in it, there was, there was no way they want to take Why it. Why the name V-6? This was a volunteer six program. The V-5 program was a flying program. And uh, I don't know, uh, it, I, it, it was a volunteer, I think, uh, and this was just a number of the program. I don't know what the one, two, three, and four were. I do know the V-5 was flying and then the V-6 was the line officer program. And uh, there were quite a few guys then in college that we were actually under a draft deferment. Uh, until we finished our schooling, which was the which was at the choice of the Navy. Of course, we were subject to to being called up. If we quit college at any time, we were immediately inducted into the Navy as an enlisted person. Uh, Pearl Harbor Day. Okay, Pearl Harbor Day. I was working, and uh, we worked at the Union. We had dances at night on Saturday night. That was Sunday morning, and. Uh, we always did a lot of major cleanup early Sunday morning in, in the Union there after these Saturday night dances. Uh, our crew there, by the way, at Iowa State, we, we did everything. We ran the, the concessions, we ran, uh, not, not the food concessions, but the door concessions, the tickets going in. We dressed in tuxedos during the dance, immediately after the dance we took off our tuxedos and got into the oldest clothes we had and swept the floors. And, and cleaned the building. And then Sunday morning we went over. Usually there might have been some activity in the morning and then we we would run coat rooms and do this sort of thing. On the morning of Pearl Harbor, I was working and uh, of course the news came as a tremendous shock. We really didn't believe it. And uh, the only thing I remember that is really outstanding was about, oh, it must have been 10, 11 o'clock, I got a call. I didn't know on the phone there and I was, uh, called over to the phone, and it was my mother, and she didn't want me to do anything drastic. So, uh, I mean, that would be my recollection. Uh, I don't think I don't think to a lot of us it was it was really uh, that much of a shock. I think the shock was the fact that we were caught, with, really caught without being in really a state of preparedness. I think there were a great many of us that had expected something. I, it's uh, I, I don't think. Uh, although the way it's written, and I don't agree with the press reports and a lot of things and the way things are played up and the way this is played up backwards, I don't think that possibly uh, you get a real true picture. Right. Well, I've interviewed quite a few people from Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor that were there, mm -hmm. and they all said, in fact, back sometime in the 30s, as one man gave a report and said that Japan will attack the U.S. at mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor, told them how the attack would be, and that's exactly what the Japanese did. Mm -hmm. But they ignored everything. Well, I think this, and it's, this is like so many events that have happened since then, and where 
as you have grown older and you've become uh, more widely read and, and this sort of thing, uh, and follow the events, they are forecast. That they're not. They're not really uh, the surprise that the press would make you believe they are. You might, or I won't say the press, but all media and even the, the politicians and people are responsible. Sir, I think they've been expected. Was there any efforts in Iowa State to uh, help the war? Well, oh, Iowa State, I probably now this is the one place I think Iowa State might have been ahead of OSU, and I can't say this because I wasn't at, at in Oklahoma, but Iowa State prior to the war, of course there was a lot of, a lot of effort had gone on and there was a lot of preparation in this, in this time uh, to, uh, because of a buildup in armed forces, but Iowa State had a lot of research. In fact, one of the fellows that read in this room I was telling you about the we lived in uh, named Joe Foster, and uh, Joe was a reserve officer. In fact, he was one in the one of the head ROTC officers. Uh, he was an outstanding student. He was a physicist, uh, uh, engineering physicist, I believe. And uh, Joe was absorbed. Instead of going as an artillery officer or whatever he would have gone, maybe as an engineering officer. I don't know. He was absorbed into the uh, defense establishment in, uh, in something I have always felt he probably went in development of the atomic bomb because it was very secret. He stayed on campus when everybody, when all the rest of us left and was still there after I left as far as I know and went into service. And Joe was uh, working as a civilian. Maybe under military order, but he was working on research. And Iowa State had a lot of un a very evidently secret research going on, and did considerable. And I think probably in the atomic energy area, I think they had some outstanding research in that. Uh, I think all the colleges were involved to an extent, but I think maybe some had uh, someone who was special and who right. led it. Down. What about the, the bond drive? You know. I, I never did see any of that. I never yeah. did see the bond drive. I never did see. Uh, we went into uh, actually my when I went into the service. I went into the midshipman training. Like I say, I was a a company officer. Um, when uh, time when they came up at the time, of course, the, the you can't make an officer out of a out of a guy that grew up on the plains of Oklahoma. I, I, this is. This is my observation in a three months period. It's impossible to make a Navy officer. You can't, you can't do it. I've got a boy that's in the Navy who is a graduate of Annapolis and has spent 15 years and the first five years they were trying to do what was supposed to have been done but it's in three months in, uh, in the midshipman school. So we came out, we were very green, but they, they, they at the time of our, they were making assignments for our classes you had two or three options of interview where there was strictly volunteer service and the PT boat duty was one of those. So uh, <coughs> all PT boat people were primarily volunteers. That is officer corps, not, not necessarily in this. Yeah. Why do you want the PT boats? Oh, they were glamorous. Uh, at that time everybody had heard about them. Of course, this is in 1943. Everybody had heard about them. They had been played up. It was kind of like flying. I would have flown probably if I could have. I, I just didn't. The flight program had closed out as far as being my chances of being accepted when I when I decided to want to fly. But I mean, it was the same thing. It was glamorous. It was a way to, you know, get in. Uh, I didn't know any more about the Navy then than most of us knew about thrashing machines, and it. Uh, I mean, it was just what you'd read and what, what looked good. What type of training did you have at Northwestern? Uh, primarily at Northwestern, you received only it was just basic mil, uh, basic naval officer training. You were you were trained for not nothing specific. You were a general. It was just a general training. Uh, the assumption was you will go on board ship. Now, actually, uh, I think for instance, navigation 
where man would be a navigator. He would have had to have learned navigation after he left midshipman training. He would he could not have taken over as navigator on the ship. He'd have had him on rocks and reefs and everything else the first time he was out. You were not really trained for anything except you were given a smattering of military discipline and uh, uh, background in a great many of the, of the naval traditions. But you were not trained for anything really. Uh, and this was this was an amazing thing that the American boys that were trained this way were able to go out and do as well uh, compared. Now, after you, I volunteered for the PT boat, PT boat duty. They had three guys come up. Uh, one of them that I let, met later, I can't remember his name right offhand. Um, one of them had served in the Pacific, who was back, and uh, their criteria. Uh, they didn't have any criteria as they, that you had to be, uh, if you were a company officer, you were given a preference. If you had athletic ability, you were given a preference. And as far as I know, small boat experience. Well, I had no small boat experience. I had some athletic. And I had been a company officer. Um, I don't know whether there was any credit given. I'm sure that there was some, as far as the grades that you had made in midshipman school, did have some bearing, although that was, I, I don't know how they did that because they were always confidential. Uh, of course, everybody sat around. The main at that time, and I, 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 I don't know whether <laughs> everybody tried to avoid the what they called the amphibious duty. This was running LSTs and and landing craft, and that was considered the the dogs of the navy. I mean, that was really. Uh, I don't. I'm not satisfied right now that that really was. I think some of those guys got the best billets and had the best duties that there was. But that was uh, at, at, in midshipman school. Everybody wanted either a big ship, a destroyer, battleship, or carrier, or uh, one of the glamour things, uh, the PT boats, and there was one or two others. I don't know sure what they were, but uh, nobody wanted amphibian. Where did you go for your PT boat training? Well, you went, you went to Melville, Rhode Island, which was a base set up uh, Narragansett Bay outside of Newport and um, it was between Newport and Providence Rhode Island but it was out on the island uh, Newport is on and uh, in the meantime I was married uh, as soon as I graduated from the midshipman school you're going to talk this in a minute or you're already going to go in uh, but uh, I, we were as soon as I graduated from I, from midshipman school, I had a little income. Man, that's the first time I'd had a steady income, and my wife and I had gone together for a couple of years. And uh, so we were married then, shortly, within three or four days after graduation. We were married on May 25th, which was Easter Sunday, and it comes on May 25th only about every eight or ten years. Um, so that when uh, when I reported for active duty and PT boats, she went with me to Mount up to Newport and lived in Newport. And Newport, of course, had always been a Navy town, and uh, it was set up for Navy and Navy wives. Uh, we had a little two-room apartment. Uh, I'll get her to explain the living condition because they're, they're kind of vague. In my mind, I was so busy, they were cramming PT boats down our throat so hard, and it was difficult because we had so much to learn in a relatively short time that it was difficult to appreciate the living conditions. But there were several of the wives, uh, of course, they were young and young people, and they did a lot of things together. And there was a kind of a close knit association. Uh, on the, when I, during the schooling period, we could only get home on weekends, and usually then it was only Saturday night. We had, come in one evening and they went back on Sunday. So it was a, there wasn't any real leave time while you were on base. You were 10 miles or 12 miles from your from town where your wife was, but you didn't see her maybe more than two or three hours during uh, the week. Um, they had what was called RON 2, which, uh, no, RON 1 at Melville, which was some boats that had been rejected as far as overseas duty. Uh, there, the time I went in, when I was, which would have been in uh, May of uh, 43, uh, they were beginning to get production of the PT, PT boats up. Up until that period, there had been a shortage. 
um, the uh, the boat production had then had gotten to the place that they were able to get equipment there at the training center that they hadn't had prior to that. I don't remember having radar on the training center on so I'm sure they did. Uh, and of course radar was the biggest thing that happened uh, to anybody in the Navy in those years. Once the boat got radar it was like uh, the blind seeing. Again. So, uh, but I don't remember the training center. Of course the, the officers who <laughs> who were in charge at the training center, who were supposed to be training us, were so jealous of their own boats and they were afraid one of those greenhorns was going to put it on the beach or ram a dock, that they didn't really train you. They took you out for boat rides and they tried to tell you how to do it, but you didn't actually have the opportunity to operate boats. Yet. And uh, so that it showed up later when, when the training would have been valuable, uh, right. we didn't have it. Any, uh, what specific training did you have for PT boats? What specific? Specific training. Well, this is at Melville. You were on PT boats being trained by PT boat officers. Most, some of them, not most of them, but some of them that had had prior experience uh, had been in the Pacific or in the, actually they had PT boats uh, out of Europe too, out of England. There were PT boats in the Mediterranean and then later uh, there were boats up in Alaska. Took part in some activities up there, so the boats were not. Uh, most people think of PT boats, think of them as South Pacific, but the boats would actually were actually used over a wide range of the of the world. There, the, uh, and the British had some boats, and the Canadians had some boats, so that there were more than just the American boats. But actually, the American, the place the PT boats and uh, the PT boats were. Not effective. Once they were not, they were not a, they were not a method of fighting a war when you had any type of larger ships. In other words, your capacities, of your firepower, your range, your, uh, your ability, your size, everything was against you. So that once, once you had uh, the capability of bringing in destroyers and other ships, the PT boats became then nothing. The PT boat probably paid their whole their whole worth in, in the Battle of Guadalcanal. And uh, the, the boys that operated there probably had more action, they saw more action in that up to Rendell Island, which was up at Munda, which was on up the Solomon Chain. But what was the actual purpose of the PT boats? Well, PT boats made primarily was made as a torpedo boat. It was almost a suicidal boat. And the idea was you put some torpedoes on a floating platform, you go out and you throw the torpedoes, and when you do that, the boat is expendable. And it was, uh, it, it, um, of course, Americans don't believe in suicidal, uh, this sort of thing, so they were built so that they could escape. And uh, the training was to, it was on sneakiness and this sort of thing, trying to, gain the advantage without being discovered and this sort of thing. This is where the training basically, and this is the reason they operated at night at that time because they were small. Uh, by the time I got into the Pacific, the effectiveness as torpedo boats was gone. What were the main targets of the PT boats? The PT boats to begin with were large ships, anything that they could sink. With, uh, when I got out, our, our targets were barges. And ours was to interrupt the transport of material and men by the Japanese from island to island or within the same island. Uh, we went up, in fact, we followed the same course that, uh, that, that Jack Kennedy did and in the, in the several of the squadrons in the Solomons. And we put, uh, we, when we went over, we, we, well, I'll give you the uh, itinerary of the way we went. We first, we shook down in Miami, Florida. Then we went to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, where we fueled. Then we ran to Jamaica, where we fueled again. Then we went, went on down to Barranquilla, Colombia, which was another base that, that they had. Now, Barranquilla, Colombia was also, when we got there and walked down the street, we were told that the, off, the people on the other side of the street were German officers. In other words, it was a, a German, used it, the German sub crews used it as much as we did, although they were not as open about it. But this was the story. I don't. I didn't recognize any of them as German, but this is what was told. Then we went to the Panama, went down to the canal, and went over to the west 
side, the Pacific side of the canal, and at Toboga Island, which is now a major fishing resort island off the coast of Panama, uh, out at the mouth of the Panama Canal, we, we shook down a final time. They had the loading facilities there on that side, and we were then loaded onto uh, the SO, that the SO Oil Company, Richmond, which was a, we went over, there were six boats on the, on the tanker, uh, four midships and two forward, that is four, two on each side midships, and then two forward on the bow of this tanker. The tanker was loaded with 100 octane gasoline for aviation fuel, so we, <laughs> We walked rather lightly for, and then the tanker, because of its speed, it could make about 19, 20 knots, which it was a new tanker, uh, did not go in convoy. And we cut, followed what was called the southern route, which cut clear down below Australia and came back up uh, into, uh, we came into Numea Caledonia, which, is, uh, which, was, which was a French island then. And we then unloaded at Numea was the port there uh, in New Caledonia. And then we went by escort. We had a, a picked up a tender ship in New Caledonia that took us on over and we went into Guadalcanal. And uh, then we left the escort and went on across, which was not very far, 40 miles maybe across. I don't, uh, maybe not that far, I don't remember. Over to Tobogi which was the operational base for the PT squadrons in the Guadalcanal area. And then we shook down two or three days or a short time there uh, in Tobogi Island with people who were, uh, this is kind of interesting because Tobogi Island there and Tobaga Island have very similar names off the coast of Panama and the one that was out off the Guadalcanal. But anyway, we, we shook down there. We went up around Sable Island, which is Iron Bottom Bay and the Solomons and the Guadalcanal area. And um, then we had orders to go to Russell Island, which was to await further order. And this was a kind of, this, of course, in any military activity, I think 50% of the time the guys are sitting. I mean, it's the most, you have to be able to sit or you're not going to win a war. So we sat on the Russell Island for about three weeks. We were all anxious to get out. We were ready to win the war, but then, I mean, we felt well trained. An interesting thing that happened while I was on, I, I enjoyed the Russell Island. I'd love to go back to it. We lived in a plantation house on Sunset Bay, which was a dividing bay between the two main islands in the Russell Island, beautiful island. Uh, the current, the tide flowed out of the bay, or flowed through it, I'm not sure which, but it would get rather strong, probably eight, ten knots at times. Um, I wasn't acquainted, uh, I wasn't into the search party, but while I was there, there was a search party organized to look for three doctors in a uh, pot, in a uh, rubber raft who had gone fishing somewhere. And I think they were attached to a marine outfit on Russell Island. And, um, I don't remember the exact details, but it turns out that one of the doctors was Dr. Uh, from Perry, uh, Dr. Evans. Hmm. And he, along with a couple of buddies who had gone fishing, had got caught in this tide and had been swept out to sea. Fortunately, they found them, but they were out in the, in the ocean. They had already been swept clear out into the open seas when they finally found them, I don't know, by search plane or boat. Uh, I was, did not, was not involved with it, but I did know about it at the time that there were three doctors adrift in the ocean out there, and we were alerted to look for them as we, we operated. And we shook down there. We had to load the boats there. There were no fueling docks for PT boats, so we had to load them with 50-gallon drums, which is both hazardous and a hell of a lot of work. And we would pull up to a dock, and they would roll the 50 gallon drum down on the boat and then the crew would have to pick them up, dump them into funnels into uh, into our to our gas tanks. And it, I mean, it was a mess. We never, well, none of us were ever more than about half loaded with gasoline because you got wore out you, you, before you, I, I don't remember for sure what our capacity was, but it seemed like it was about 2,000 gallons of gasoline. So we operated about half tanks the whole time we were in the Russell Island. Would you give me a description 
Okay, a PT boat, they called them plywood, but actually they were not a plywood boat, they were a laminated boat. They were the boats that, that fought the war, they really became, the original boats were shorter, I, they're about 76 feet, uh, something like this. Uh, the PT boat that was used and developed as the most effective boat was an 80-foot boat. There were two primary boats. There were more boats built. There was a uh, the company that was the Elko and the Higgins Company of the two primaries. Then there was a Hutchins Company. There was a Scott Payne, which was a Canadian boat. Uh, then there was one or two British boats. The Hutchins, Scott Payne, Elko, and Higgins were the primary. But then it evolved down to the final two, which was the the Higgins and the Elko. I was on a Higgins boat. It was built in New Orleans by the Andrew Jackson Higgins Boat Factory in New Orleans. The Elko boat was a more refined boat, and it was designed and built as more of a live-on boat. And it it was not nearly as good in rough water, in, as far as taking rough water, but it was certainly a lot better boat to live on. And like I said, 90% of the time you were living on the boat, and it <laughs> we were we were a little bit envious of the guys on the Higgins. I mean, on the Elko. Our boat was a good boat, um, but in um, get back to your question, the design, the boats were made of three pieces of about three quarter inch to one inch mahogany. They were laminated together in a in a three three layer plat piece and screwed, and I don't know how many hundred pounds of brass screws went into them. And they were all screwed at that time by hand. These plywood were screwed together. Uh, the boat design was good. Uh, the decks, of course, were wood. Uh, there was very little actual metal in the construction of them outside of the screws uh, that held them together. They had three uh, Packard engines, 12 V engines, that were a relatively new engine, a high powered engine developed by Packard Motor. And uh, they had 1,250 horse. And then when we got in the island, they came out with a supercharger, and we jacked them up to about 1,500 horsepower. So they had you had 4,500 horsepower on the boat. And how fast did that go? Well, uh, they were they were probably I would say a good clean slick bottom, not fully loaded. I mean, if it was just built to run, it could go about 45 miles which is better than 45 miles an hour. You put them in the water in the South Pacific and three weeks after they're in the water you had a foul bottom. And we never did figure out. They tried all sorts of copper paints and everything, had a fouling everything. But in three weeks you would probably cut your speed down to not over 35 miles. So what's a foul bottom? Well, that's where you have moss growth on it. In other words, you would get a moss and kind of a barnacle growth on the bottom and it just cut your speed to nothing. So uh, actually, if, if uh, fortunately I would never chase one of them, but we didn't have a great deal more speed than a Jap destroyer. The Japs had destroyers at that time that were faster than the American destroyer. So that uh, your chances of outrunning the Jap destroyer were not very good if you, in, if you encountered one. Um, the, boats were, the boats were divided. We had three separate boats in our squad. We had one boat that was primarily just a, teep, just a torpedo. He had four aerial torpedoes in a side rack. When we first went out, we shot them out of the tube, which was sh shooting with a firing mechanism that shot the torpedo out of the tube when under a percussion tank. Then we went to what they call the, the side drop, uh, which was uh, an aerial torpedo. It was a shorter, stubbier torpedo than the, than the original Mark 13. And it was dropped over the side. You got speed up, you went along, you threw it over the side, it was set at a predetermined angle and you figured all your, uh, a PT boat firing a torpedo is the worst platform you could get for firing a torpedo because they were so small they were always going this way and this way and uh, you almost had if you hit something you had to sit on top of it and this was difficulty in the, that the first fellows had with them the only way you hit something was getting such close range that you, then you were under their close their small arms fire um, and also visibility because but anyway, uh, <coughs> we developed the torpedo. Then we also had what would have been just a standard boat. He carried some armament, uh, uh, 
50, between 50 caliber, 37 caliber, 45, uh, 40s. Uh, but he also carried two torpedoes. And then we developed, while we were out there, and this was 100% barge fighter, was the barge boat. And this was a boat to put a 40 millimeter cannon on both ends of it. And then put twin 50s lined the sides, and when they, they were awesome when they fired. I mean, you could go in, you could strafe, you could do anything with them. Uh, it was a tremendous amount of firepower on a platform. That's all the boat served at was a, was a platform for guns. But you lost all your movement maneuverability. You lost all your speed. You put so much weight on, so much to carry shells and the equipment. Uh, Boy, I mean, you bogged down to about 25 knots at, at height, and you couldn't go. I mean, you were at risk with those big guns on there any time you went anywhere. And I didn't. I was never, never was on those. I was always on the intermediate one. We carried both torpedoes and on, and, and guns. And uh, in the boat, the way it was divided, the forward compartment was a rope compartment, a rather small compartment. Then we had the cruise quarters. And actually, there were probably you could sleep eight men in the crew's quarters. The normal crew, when they first started out, was about eight men and two officers. Well, by the time we put on the extra guns, you had to put on extra men to man them. So you ended up with a crew of about 12 um, and two officers. So that most of the time, we had men sleeping ashore. We couldn't sleep, or if it was fit weather, why they would sleep on deck if they wanted to stay out on the boat. But if it was bad weather, we would have four or five guys sleeping ashore, and the base force would have, have room for them. What's the crew of BT boat? How many total? Well, the, the original crews, they figured, I, I, I would, on our original boats, I think we had eight or nine men. You had uh, two to three engineers, you had at least two gunners mates. You had a quartermaster radio man and a cook. Uh, you had one boatswain's mate, and he might be base force. but. Uh, that would be basically the crew. Uh, it would vary. Sometimes you would get a gunner's mate who would work as an engineer, and uh, it was a very uh, democratic organization. Everybody jumped in and did what everybody, what anybody else did when they needed help. Uh, my rule was everybody clean guns. After patrol, when we came in, before anyone, we had, we would generally, before anyone could sack out and sleep, we cleaned guns. I never did want to sleep or take time out with a gun, it wasn't ready to fire. I mean, this was just, and uh, <laughs> I had a friend who, friend officer who was a senior officer to me and was section leader quite often, and he always rode my boat, and I thought he rode because he liked me. <laughs> but about three years ago, we went to a reunion, and uh, the fellow's name is Wes Walker, he lives in Greenville, uh, Greenville North, South Carolina. And uh, I asked, I said something to Wes about it. I said, Wes, I, you know, I said, I always thought that was nice. You wanted to ride your boat because you liked me. And he said, hell, I didn't ride your boat because I liked you. He said, I rode your boat because whenever you started shooting guns, they'd all fire. <laughs> I guess that was typical of a lawyer. He was, <laughs> he, he had, he was not, he's taking Sherry's own neck was <laughs> covered before he rode a boat. Mm -hmm. that, that was, uh, um. Were the PT boats effective? For what they were used for, yes. But basically, I think they saved Guadalcanal to a great extent in that the Japs came down and we didn't have any Navy that was effective fighting. We had, every time we got tangled with them, we'd get whipped, really, is what it amounted to, and we made some fiascos down there our own fault. The PT boats went out and heckled them, and it, the, the Japs, got to the place they were gun shy of PT boats, which, whether you sunk a ship or not, was effective. Yeah. And uh, of course, I mean, all true credit, uh, as far as I'm concerned on Guadalcanal, goes to the U.S. Marines and the 1st Army Division, the Americal Division, I don't know, not the 1st Marine Division and the Americal Division of the Army. As far as I'm concerned, they were the ones that, that won the war in Solomon. Um, we were effective as a harassment. Uh, we were not effective in taking bases. Uh, we, we did a lot of support activities. We supported some landings. Uh, we, uh, but basically our, our duty was to go, was to protect the perimeter. Basically, the 
in my particular squadron, and there are a great many other squadrons in the Solomon, but our squadron was based at, at Bougainville. We went in shortly after the invasion. We were not in the invasion force itself. I don't think they wanted us out there. They had destroyers in, and so they could go in, and, and they didn't need PT boat. They didn't send a PT boat at, at the time in the 43. They didn't send a PT boat out after a big jack ship. I mean, that would have been stupid. We had the ships out there. We sent ships and planes. And shortly afterwards, by the middle of uh, 44, we had complete control of the Solomons air. So that it was, uh, what we were trying, trying to do was protect our perimeter by preventing, by preventing any of the movement of supplies in. And actually, about the only way they could move any quantity of supplies was by water. Uh, and the Japs, it was militarily, I give, I don't know whether it was MacArthur or who determined where we would establish a landing on uh, Bougainville. But it was an ideal place, although it looked stupid to begin with. It was an ideal place. We landed in a swamp and built a base out of a, what was uh, what was then a swamp. The Japs surrounded the base, the perimeter around. At the beginning, when we got there, the perimeter was about three miles long and a mile wide. And uh, that's not very much land to control. But the thing was, the Japs had to come through a swamp to get to it. So. It was smart in that you had put them at the same disadvantage and you were better equipped because you had the sea on your side. So then the minute you controlled the sea for the Japs, uh, you really had them isolated. And they were in a, they were in a very, it was a tough situation. What direct action were you in? Well, primarily most of the action you would call skirmishes. Um, you'd run into a barge, somebody transporting troops or material, you never knew what they were transporting, you just knew there was a barge out there. By then we had radar, and like I say, radar put us at a tremendous advantage to the barge traffic because the barge, the Jap barge, did not have radar. So we we had we had an advantage in that we could practically all of their equipment that was on the water we could pick up far before they could pick up us. And so you would pick up a barge if it was in an area that you could go into. You would go in and do your best to shoot it up. Nine times out of ten, you never knew what you had done. You went in, you shot. Very seldom did you get very much return fire. The Japs were deathly afraid of the PT boat. And if you had seen them firing at night, of course we used tracers, which made it all that much more. But if you would see a PT boat, on the stern we'd have a 40 millimeter. Shortly in front of that, we had a twin 50 on a mount. We had twin 50s in a turret mount. On the bow, we had a 37. Well, when all these guns started firing in one direction, it blind any. I mean, it just, you couldn't see. So the, there were skirmishes. We we ran into barges uh, in different places. We we our basic patrol at the beginning was was the was Bougainville, and we patrolled the perimeter there. And this was just shortly after the invasion and. I don't know, well, one night we worked, uh, by the way, another uh, person that I have run into since then was my doctor who was uh, unfortunately killed in an airplane accident two or three years ago, but my doctor was a black cat pilot and flew over us at Bougainville, and I'm sure that we operated jointly there at different times because he was flying up from, uh, I forget the name of the base that he was on, but it was a base below us and in uh, the Solomon. But you would go out. All the patrols were at night. We operated pr primarily within a half mile of the beach. We tried to stay in as close as we could. I can remember going on a destroyer, which, you know, is a pretty good sized ship, and feeling completely vulnerable because you were exposed. On a destroyer, you sit way up high here. I mean, I, you get out on a night and you're sitting way up there. Man, everybody can see you. On PT boats, you were down on the water, you were sneaking around. I felt very secure on a PT boat and very insecure on a destroyer. You take a guy off a destroyer, put him on a PT boat a half mile offshore, and he knew he was done in. I mean, that was it. So, I mean, it's where the guy got accustomed. But um, the problem we had, we probably, there were more boats lost. Oh, I won't say more, but a great many boats were lost on reef, getting stranded. Now, I was on the reef one night, and they, what they call actually niggerhead, which were coral knotheads that came up. And if you ever got in them, you were in trouble. 
And we got in them, and prior to the time we got in them, there had been a boat in the same area, within a very short distance where we were, that had sat there till after daylight and was hit by an anti-tank gun, a Jap anti-tank gun on the beach, and lost several men. So you can imagine how we were. We were seesawing the boat, trying to back it out of this coral, and fortunately we did get it out. But, uh, it, I mean, we were on it probably for an hour. And it was probably one of the longest hours I've ever spent in my life. Because you, you went into the water, you were in shark infested water, and that water in the Pacific is shark infested. Yeah. And you don't get in the water unless you have to, anywhere. And then the fact that you had Japs over here about a half mile off with guns that could shoot accurate enough to hit you with one shot. And the way they do is pull a, a gun down on the beach, fire once, and get back in the woods before cover, you could get aircraft cover. And it uh, it wasn't, wasn't and that was off the Torquina River, which was the big Jap base uh, there in Empress Augusta Bay. Now, when you say the invasion, is this the Philippines? No, this is all in Solomon. This is Solomon Island. Solomon. Okay. Uh, when we left the Solomons, we went up to Green Island. We secured the Solomons, and it was turned over to the Australians. And I don't know how the Aussies have patrolled it, but it, the, uh, by the time it was turned, they were completely they were completely neutral. And then we went to Green Island, which was uh, which was an island north of the Solomon, and it was not considered bay, part of the Solomon chain. Uh, we operated in, out of New Ireland, I mean Green Island, over to New Ireland and New Britain. And on New Britain was, um, I keep wanting to say Munda, but it was not, we, Munda was down on Rendova. We came through M Rendova, and that was where Kennedy operated out of and was lost his boat was down on me. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I can't think of what's a big base, but it was the main Jap base in the, in the Southwest Pacific. Uh, was on New Britain. And so we operated up through the channel between New Ireland and New Britain. But to get there, we had to run about 50, 60 miles of open water to get there. And then we went into this channeling operator. Well, it cut the amount of time because of the gas consumption. Our boats were, you know, the size of the engine had a huge tremendous amount of gas, and we didn't have the capacity. Uh, it had been much more efficient. The German E-boat, it was about that time, was a much more efficient boat. It had a diesel engine and could go out and operate much longer than we could, and much wider range. But anyway, uh, why can't I think of that island? In fact, I looked it up one time just to get it. Um, for that base. Um, but anyway, we would operate up into this channel. The channel was fairly narrow, about probably 10 to 15 miles. Well, in areas, some areas, but it was closer than that, maybe 10 miles. You would go up and uh, go in there, and you were trying to inter intercept traffic between the two islands. Uh, the part that was bad was the fact that New Ireland natives were never friendly to the American or to white people. They were, they were pro-Japanese, and uh, even the coast watchers, who the PT boats quite often put coast watchers ashore in different areas, and these were primarily Australians who had been in the country before and had friends among the natives. Um, you could not, you couldn't get on on New Ireland. The natives would get you. I mean, they were after you as much as the Japs were. So that it was a kind of a tough situation. Um, we picked up uh, one day, uh, we were going up on patrol, two F 4U Corsairs, uh, which were Marine pilot planes. Came, one of them came around the point of New Ireland, saw us, came over, and we could talk to them on a VHF radio, and uh, said his buddy was in trouble, and we go in a direction, I don't remember exactly how, but we would set a course where we could might intercept him. We did. This guy came flying his F4U about 50 feet over the water. The minute he saw us, he ditched him. And we picked him up. In fact, he, he was in his life raft before the plane went down. But they'd been flying up over this Jap base and had gone in a little bit low, and he'd been hit with that aircraft fire, and gasoline was flooding the cabin. So he was fortunate in that we were there because he was off the coast of New Ireland and if he'd had to ditch off of New Ireland he probably never would have gotten ashore. They'd have gotten him before he 
he got the short. So he was a happy man that day. And, uh, but this was the situation. We did control, the American forces did control quite a bit in New Britain. But, uh, uh, what is that? I don't know, I'm just completely, I know that uh, Borpop was the Air Force, was the air base, they had an air base on New Ireland. One time we had a commanding officer, his name was Montgomery, we called him, not even a little short fellow, he was, he was a full, full commander, which was a towering officer in, in our day. Because most of our, 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 the skippers of our squadrons were lieutenant commanders. Most of us were lieutenant JGs when we got boat command or lieutenant. And so that we very seldom saw a senior officer in our section. By the way, we lived, and the PT boats lived on Army rations. We did not live Navy, and the Navy lived like kings compared to what the Army did. Why, why Army rations? Because we were always land-based. We never, we were never connected with a fleet. We were always connected with an Army unit somewhere. So that we drew, we drew our supplies and, and, uh, and all of this from the Army. The Army did not dictate our orders. Uh, because we were operating away from the units that we drew supply from. They were land-based units. We were operating in the sea base. But uh, I've eaten enough Australian jackrabbits <laughs> to last a years and years. The Army, I don't know how they did it. I think they threw them to the dogs or something. Because Australian rabbit and lamb, and uh, this was an issue. I've got to ask one question. Okay. Why was Kennedy's boat cut in half? Why? Why was Kennedy's boat cut in half. Well, Kennedy's boat probably was cut in half because he went to sleep, or they, they went to sleep, got too close to a, a ship that was bearing down on them. Uh, they did not have radar, and this, you can't blame them too much. I mean, this is, when you get a dark night, it's awfully easy. Uh, it was it, It's one of those things that just happened. Um, I don't know whether... Uh, I, I'm. They had not made contact with the ship prior to its cutting them in two. They just saw it coming. Uh, he was not making a torpedo run or anything like that on the ship. It's quite possible the ship had seen him first, which they, which they could do. Uh, in the direction he was coming from, the way the, the way the light was or something like that, he, he could have seen Kennedy first. I don't think, no, I think Kennedy was probably, he was like the rest of us. Only thing was, Kennedy represented the group of the, the, the big bunch of officers that went as first choice officers he was out a year. He was out a year ahead of me, but these were guys who had had considerable sailing experience, who were acquainted on big water. When I went in, there were very few of us that had had this experience. And it, like I said at the beginning here, it, it, it's a long time learning, and any experience on big water is better than none. And most of us had none. I, for example, we got lost in the first time we went out at night. We got lost in Miami Harbor. Uh, and if you can <laughs> get, get lost in there and you're going out and fighting the Pacific, you're in pretty bad shape, I'll tell you. Uh, we pulled some fiascos. I mean, it was just the fact that you were not experienced. That, but later on, after a year, I mean, we were hot shot. We could take boats and put them three foot apart and run all night long. And, uh, I mean, you developed a night vision then. I, I've known, I know it now. I have it now. Even it's a, it's a sense that you develop. Uh, you can see things at night that no one else can. And uh, you, but this, it, it's a long time in developing. You don't do it the first three months that you're in the Navy. Uh, so that uh, I appreciate. In other words, I appreciate the the time that they take with the naval officers. And I'm thinking of my son when I say this to make them qualified. I think that it's time well spent because it does. Those boys are much better able to do what they should. Uh, we made some mistakes that cost some lives. And this is true of any war. I don't care where it is going to be some. Uh, and it's no fault of any of them. Of any, of anyone. It's just the fact that you weren't trained properly and you haven't had enough time. As you, the more training you get, the more you get. But we can't have, in our system, we can't have professional full-time Navy are all we need. Another question. Uh, you know, in the land of making mistakes and all that, mm -hmm. the Japanese ship, the Okioyo Maru, 
it was, a, I don't know if that's a proper name, but it was a ship taking American prisoners to Japan, mm -hmm. and we bombed it. Mm -hmm. Was that bombed by airplanes or by the Navy? Or do you, well, what as you I say? understand, as I remember, that was done by, by planes. By planes? Yeah, I, but I, I remember the name and just uh, some of them, but I'm not really... Because familiar. I understand the Japanese did not mark the ships. No, it was not marked at all, yeah. No, actually, well, of course, there are there are all sorts of incidents. I'm not saying the Americans, but I don't believe I don't believe this uh, in uh, the My Lai massacre and things like that. I think are blown completely out of proportion, and these things bother me. And that the American press is able to blow things out, and I blame the press primarily because the military is doing the very best job it can under very extreme circumstances. And uh, when you're out on a, when you're out and they're shooting at you, and you've had guys lost next to you and things like that, and you go in some place and they're shooting at you, brother, you're going to shoot everything you can. I was in Vietnam when that happened. Yeah, and it those things, those things bother me. In that war is not nice, and it, it should be there should be some way to do away war is completely. I don't think we will in any lifetime that we have. Yeah. But the thing is that war is not nice, and there. I don't call them atrocities. There are things that are done under the stress of war. Now, I consider it atrocities when, uh, like the Russians stand 19,000 Polish officers up and shoot them and bury them. That is an atrocity. But when guys who are not professional soldiers and who have, do not have professional soldiers under them do things on a battlefield that might not be considered humane by all the people that love dogs and everything else, that that to me is not an atrocity. That is survival. And when you're out there, you believe in survival. Yeah. And uh, that survival is primarily the, the, the name of the game. And I have been in situations in, in the Pacific where, where survival was basically the fundamental thing. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't put myself above a lot of other people I've seen persecuted and prosecuted. And I don't. I think quite possibly in the same situations, I might have been very much inclined to take their same route. Uh, I won't say that I will, but I'm, I think I can understand a great deal of what they what they have done. There are no there are no international laws when you're fighting a war, and, and especially on the battle. Uh, fortunately, when we got out, the war had the war had gone. We by the time I got into the Pacific, they had enough big ships that when there was any sizable Jap force encountered, we had force to send out without sending PT. Uh, I left the Solomons, went to Green Island. We operated out of Green Island, and this was a this was a hard operational area because of the long run of open water we had to make to the operating area. I started to tell you about Snuffy Smith a minute ago, the little, the little short command. Snuffy was a hell of a guy to operate. He was one of these gung-ho, guys that really like to get things done. So he decided that this Borpop airfield was at the north end of, of New Ireland. And it was well fortified. They had good aircraft, anti aircraft fire and all of this. I think it had been pretty well neutralized as far as planes were concerned, but it was well protected. It was about a mile inland, a uh, half mile inland, part of it. And they had found some, they were on the the, our side of the island. So Sanofi decided we would put mortars on our boat and we would go up and we would mortar <laughs> Borpop Airfield. So we, you know, you know how the mortars are, you have to put them down with sandbags if you haven't got some way to, way to stabilize them. We put, I don't know, I guess probably 20 sandbags on the bow of the boat. Our boat was the one he picked. I don't know. I think Snuffy picked it maybe because our gun shot all the time too. I didn't know that at the time. I always wondered why he did. But he, uh, we put this mortar up there, and we, this was army mortar. This was not maybe didn't have any. And we got I don't know three or four big boxes of mortar shells, and all the stuff that went with them, and we went out outside the bay and fired fired a few mortars to be sure we knew how to do it. We left early in the evening and went up to Borpot. And this was the air base on New Island. Uh, as I remember, I, 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 this, I, I, 
I wonder, because two or three times we went up there and we got shot at when you were about two miles off the beach, which indicated that they probably had radar and were following you in. And they were just kind of random shots. They'd, they'd maybe shoot one or two. They had pretty good sized shells. I mean, three, four inch shells. And they'd explode and that would be it. Maybe they were mortars, I don't know. But we were underway and moving and they never did, as far as I know, that never did hit us on that side. We lost lost some people on the other side of, of the line. And I don't remember this particular morning. It seemed like that they fired on us, but I'm not sure. But we had to get in with a half mile of the beach, or well, we got in closer than that. We got in so close, you felt like you could pick, pick you know, coconuts off the tree and started shooting mortars at both of them. <laughs> we sat out there for 30 minutes, just at daylight, because light was just beginning, so you could see the tree and through mortars as fast as we could with this one mortar. We were giving more pop the fit. Well, that was so much fun to Snuffy <laughs> that he decided then we would run the whole coast of New Ireland and, and mortar everything we saw. So, the, of course, the native villages along the coast, and a lot of them were along the coast, were built on stilts. They had the stilts with the grass hut. And we went down the coast mortaring every native village on And of course, I think the natives had all heard we were coming and had left. I don't know how they, but uh, we didn't see a native. We didn't see a soul, but we mortared. <laughs> but this, of course, is the island that the natives were also unfriendly. So it was illegal mortaring because the natives were. But we didn't, we certainly didn't have a friendship mission, but I didn't, I didn't see a native. I don't think we heard anything. We never did hit a hut. And, but we did, we did go down the coast to New Orleans border. And I'm sure Snuffy Smith had a good morning out there. What, when was this? What, what month and year? This would have been in uh, late, this would probably have been in the middle of 44. And to the first of 45. Um, well, I wish I could think of the name of the eye. We never did capture the Jap base there on New Britain, the main Jap base. Okay, but I'll go from there. I mean, I'm trying trying to keep this uh, these, some of these anecdotes that I'm giving are a little interesting, maybe. They are to me. We get together and talk about them. Some of them seem like they were only yesterday. But um, we left New Ireland, uh, I mean, Green Island, I'm sorry, uh, well, the New Ireland operating area, and they were preparing for the landing in the Philippines. So we went to Ley, which is on New Britain, and fuel. We went from Green Island, we went first to Munda, which was an island where we refueled, then to Ley, which was at the tip of New Britain. And then probably the most, yes, uh, probably one of, of the most uh, I guess thrilling moments I had. Any, I, I'd say one of the most thrilling moments in my life was the morning we had been we'd been traveling all night. Uh, this is the squadron we were moving. We had all our equipment aboard, all our personnel. We had uh, the ground force, the ground base had been traveled, had been transferred, but by LST uh, we weren't carrying air equipment. We had everything, and all we had, I don't know, probably 15 men on board. Uh, the morning was real foggy, and we came up to Hollandia Harbor. And we had now you have to rec you have to remember we're off on Green Island here, operating into New Britain, New Ireland. Green Island is, is a tropical island with an atoll. Uh, it's got a lagoon in the middle. There was an air base on the far side of it. We were about ten miles from it on of the lagoon. The lagoon was a big lagoon. We never, but we were out on this, out on this perimeter island, which was a little dinky island. We hadn't seen anything. The only thing, I guess the biggest thing that happened out there, and I have loved the guy ever since, was Bob Holt, came to the air base. He didn't even know that there was a PT base out there. I am transgressing here again. That's okay. Um, Bob Holt came and was going to put on a performance at the air base, which had a lot of people. And uh, he heard about the PT base out there. He sent word some way he'd come out one afternoon. He was only on the island today. But they would come out and give an extra performance. 
So the boat, there were two boats just passed immediately to the air base. They picked up Bob Holt. They had Jerry Colonna, Francis Langford, all the harmonica player, uh, I don't remember what his name, but anyway, he and then he had a couple of good-looking girls. I mean, beautiful girls. And but Jerry Cohen and Bob Hope, Francis Langford, were the Larry Adler, the harmonica player. And then there was um, another girl and another dancer, a boy, that was in the pro within the group, and they were good. And I remembered their name for years. I forgot them now. And then later we saw. But Bob Hope came out, and he put on a program. It was raining. It, it was kind of a drizzle, um, a, a typical uh, tropical drizzle. We had, and it, it was a typical. We had a theater there. We did get old movies, and what we had for seats were halved coconut logs. I mean, they, they were sitting out there, and that's what we sat on. We didn't have any chairs or anything like that. And this was a the theater, and. In the meantime, as soon as they heard Bob Hope was there, they extended the theater and put a few more flanks out so that there was more of a stage. We didn't really have a stage, so that the stage was probably six foot wide and uh, maybe 15, 20 foot long. And then somebody had put up some curtains. I mean, everybody on the base chipped in to get this thing ready. It was a beautiful program. Well, um, Bob Hope and the rest of them, they were so carried away, they stayed they came in and they had drinks with us and everybody stood around and talked. In fact, it, Bob Hope was about an hour late for giving the Army program that was scheduled for a hell of a lot more people than we were out there on the island. But I've always loved Bob Hope for that. Uh, Jack Benny came, but he wouldn't think of coming out to a little dinky out. I mean, that, of course, he, maybe he didn't know about it, but, you know, that's the way we looked at it. But everybody there loved Bob Hope, and I, I had pictures of Bob Hope and Francis Langford, and we all kissed Francis Langford and all this sort of stuff. And um, all my memento, by the way, I was going to offer to give some of them, all my memento, we moved in Oklahoma City after I came back and was working there. And I had put everything that I had, all my keepsakes and my log books and this, in a paper sack to move. My wife thought it was junk. And so I lost, I have, None of this is right. I have my naval papers, of course, and all of this, but I don't have all of these keepsakes. I had Jap uh, chastity belts that I had taken off of the barge that I that had the names of the people in his village with a big rising sun. I was, you know, this sort of thing. I had Jap shells and things like that. But I, we don't have, I don't have any of them. And I, I hate missing, I, lo I hate losing it because I had a lot of pictures both of crew, which named the crews, and uh, and things like Jack Benny's. I had some of those. What number was the boat? Well, this is what, you know, I've been trying to think. I was actually on three boats, and I am not real sure. Uh, you go on the boat, I went on the boat as an executive officer. Then I uh, transferred to another boat as executive officer. Then I got my own boat. And it seemed like my boat was a 267. Our series ran from two, something like 258 to 270, but it seemed like it was 267. I am not sure, and this is, I guess, old age memory. Uh, you're the second person that asked me. On that list that I gave you, Bob Powers from here was on base force, and he's quite active in this PT boat order organization. And he asked me the other day, I was mentioned a fellow, he's going to a convention that's held this week, going to start this weekend. And he asked me, uh, I had a fellow named Tony Esposito who was on my boat as a gunner's mate, and I said, well, he's quite active. I said, well, if you're up there, you'll see Tony Esposito. I said, I wish you'd give him my regards. But, uh, and he said, well, what boat was that? <laughs> I couldn't think of my boat. Where's the convention being held? This particular one is held in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, okay. Uh, the PT Boat Officers Convention, which which is a different organization, was held in New Orleans this spring, and we had some illness in the family, and I wasn't able to go. I would have liked to have gone. Um, I have not. I have contributed to this organization, and they actually have built a PT Boat Museum at Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, along, it, there is quite a naval. They have got uh, an aircraft carrier and a old battleship and two or three others in a naval type display area up there in the bay. 
and they have a museum built inside uh, one of the one of the battleships, and then they also have some buildings housing uh, rebuilt PT boats, uh, a World War II PT boat. So that if anybody's in Falls River, uh, it's a good it's a good place to go. Both na naval history from PT boats and other uh, other areas too, as well. And I've been there, and it, they've done a lot, and it has all been done by voluntary contributions by primarily P.T. Boat people and their families. Uh, there was a fellow, um, well, I'm not, I won't go in there because I can't remember the name, but there have been one or two people who were enlisted personnel who were very active, like Bob Powers and these other who have been very active, read somebody that lived over by Tahlequah at a lumberyard over there quite active and he passed away and his wife has remained Red Atkins and I'm not sure where he's uh, I didn't know him I never did I never met him but he was very active and was written up in several other articles so there are people in there are a few people in Oklahoma that have been active uh, were you in the invasion of Philippines no we went up uh, when we, like I say, oh, I didn't get, I got you to Hollandia Harbor and left you there. I've got to get back to Hollandia Harbor. We came up in the fog, and of course, across the mouth of the harbor, they had uh, submarine nets. And you had a certain period. They would open those nets for 30 minutes or so. They were very strict because submarines could sneak underneath and get in when the nets were open. So you had to be all lined up, ready to go in in a hurry when the nets opened. Uh, it was foggy. We couldn't see into the bay. All we could see were these sub-tenders, and we couldn't see more than probably a quarter of a mile. We got up close to the tenders, and there were one or two other ships waiting to go in, not big ships. The fog lifted just as we went in, and when, we, when it lifted, the entire Philippine invasion fleet was in front of us. And it was the most awe-inspiring thing. I mean, if you can imagine battleships, aircraft, destroyers, a hub of activity, ships running everywhere, little ships, you know, convoy and convoy, and for miles. Well, here we had been on um, Green Island for years, well, oh, for years, up there, up in the Solomons for two years, hadn't seen, uh, our, we'd see three destroyers and it would look like a, a military uh, procession, normal, I mean, procession. And here, all at once, we saw the entire invasion fleet, and it just completely you were flabbergasted. You couldn't, it was beyond your comprehension. Well, we went in, and of course, one of the favorite things to do anytime any kind of supply ship or destroyer came into your area, before, when you were in PT, well, first thing you did was run out and beg food. I mean, you've been living on army chow. These guys would come in, most of them had just come from a, from a base where they had, you know, they had freezer supplies, they had fresh meat, they had, I mean, good stuff, ice cream. And that sort of thing. Hey, so you would run out and moot. Well, the first thing we thought about when we got in the bay was to go moot something to eat. And we pulled up along a, a battleship. And I don't remember which one it was, but it was, had a... When we pulled up, the, the sides of the battleship sloped way out. And we were sitting out, and we could get out and walk up on them. And uh, I don't remember. We got a whole bunch. Of that. They practically sunk our boat with stuff to eat. And just amazing. But it's awfully hard not to get emotional when you think about that particular time. And uh, I guess we realized then that, that we were winning the war. Because we knew we were going somewhere, but we hadn't, we hadn't seen it. We'd been out throwing rocks at, at Goliath, and uh, the, the war was being fought in another area. But anyway, we went to the north end of... Uh, to Biak Island, which is north of uh, New Guinea. It's part of the New Guinea Island, but it's, it's, it was a staging base, a PT boat staging base for the Philippines. Um, the, they landed on Lady while we were there. This invasion fleet moved out. We didn't see them move out. We were only in Hollandia long enough to refuel and uh, I guess probably three days. I know I went ashore there and was messing around and heard uh, some noise in the woods where I was. I went over and there was a native building a canoe. He was chopping it out with a kind of 
kind of a little lax. Like, and I watched him for a little while. But I mean, uh, that basically, I don't remember very much about it except the fleet that was there. But it was, uh, it was when you realized that uh, you weren't alone. I mean, I guess that's what it was. Because before you felt like, man, we're doing it all and nobody's doing it. Uh, We went on up to Biak. We refueled. I don't remember much more about it. I don't even remember leaving Hollandia. It's kind of an odd thing. I don't. We left and went to Biak. And then they, while we were there, they invade, invaded Lady. And they were equipping some boats while, uh, not in my squadron, but a boat there at, uh, uh, at Biak to. Uh, Act as decoy boats because we knew the Japs had radar by the way. She's up there. Uh, so, uh, what they were doing was putting a lot of metal sheeting on them. And they were going to run them up and use them as decoy boats, uh, which they did. And at the Battle of Lingayan Gulf, PT boats were used as decoys, but the idea had originated down at Biak. Uh, of course, they had the Kamikaze bombers up there then. I mean, there was there was all of this going on. Well, about the time our squadron, uh, they had so many PT boats. If you realize how many, when you pull all of them out of New Guinea, all of them out of the, uh, the Solomons, and, and put them all up there, and I mean, it looked like a, you know, I mean, we had a flotilla of boats there, a lot more boats than could effectively be used. So that they, I don't think they really, I don't think that they really knew what they were going to do. Uh, there were guys that went up. Uh, I, I knew one of them, name was John Hagen, who was not in my squadron, but he had graduated in, from the same class I did at Iowa State. And John was a very good PT boat officer, and he was selected as one to go up. He was a forester too, by the way. Uh, selected to go up to Lady and observe and make any suggestions that might be. And so the, I talked to him after he came back, and he was up there doing some of that those, uh, dive bomber, those kamikaze bomber experiences, and uh, it was kind of interesting to talk to him, but he was the only man that I talked to that had actually been up there during that, that period. Well, I at that time, then, then our orders came. Of course, we were we were told when we went to the Pacific, you live in the islands in the jungle for a year and you come home. Well, we had been out two years then, which was a year longer than what, then I, it was understandable why it wasn't, we weren't. But when your orders came, brother, you were ready to go home. <laughs> and there wasn't, like I say, there wasn't a great deal look, to look forward to in the Philippines. And I, I don't know, of course. Then we didn't know anything about the Philippines. The Philippines, as far as we were concerned, were like the islands we'd just come from. And there ain't a whole lot on those islands. It's like if there's any cultivation at all, it's coconut trees, and the rest of it's all jungle. And there's not any incentives to stay on those places. I mean, you know, so uh, there was the option was made to go to the Philippines. Uh, by then, I had a new executive officer named was Olson from California. And Olson was a good officer, and he was a, he was he had, he was an older fellow. I don't know Olson probably was ten years my senior, uh, but he was a, he was a good a good officer, and I felt he was he was capable. I didn't feel like I was abandoning my boat and crew when I when I left. I felt I had, and we had had enough time. He had been on a Green Island. He had had enough time operating air and. He was anxious for command, and he was going to get the boat, and I thought, well, this is a good time to do it. So when the orders came through, I accepted my orders rather than I, there were two or three officers that got orders that volunteered to go to the Philippines. And uh, they went on up, although they didn't get there at the time of the, the big activity. They got up and then did, in fact, uh, RON 23's boats were all dispersed in Mindanao. I think some of them went to the Indochina or not Indo, to, I don't know. But they were all in the Philippines was the end of the squad, and that was when it was the boats, as far as boats went. And they all disappeared there in 
Philippines took some, the Filipino or whoever was doing it, some of them went over to, I don't know what forces it was operating off in the end of China, but there was something, some forces there that went. Uh, I came back and I've talked to two or three of the officers that went up, and they didn't have a great deal of activity up there uh, in the Philippines because of the big ships. And there was already too many planes, big ships, everything was pretty well neutralized. And then on so many of those islands, the Japs had established bases. I know on Mindoro they had, they operated there, but there really wasn't much of a Jap operation on it. The Japs had evidently maintained the bases at, uh, on Leyte and on the chain up towards the Manila rather than the side. Um, so I came back. I flew back to. Uh, we flew from Biak to Kwajalein and then to. Pearl Harbor. I was trying to think how we made that, but anyway. Oh, we lit, uh, we lit at Johnson Island. And uh, we were there about two hours, and there was some B-29s at Johnson Island. And I went over, I had my cousin, who, who was Dwayne Treeman, was a B-29 pilot. And he had flown B-29 somewhere, or not, no, not B-24, well, I'm not sure what he flew. He flew uh, in the Caribbean on sub patrol, and then he had gone into the B-29. But anyway, to make a long story short, we were on Johnson Island about an hour and two hours refueling, and I went down to where there was one B-29 being worked on. And there was an officer there, and I asked him, I said, uh, by any chance are you acquainted with uh, Dwayne Treeman? They called him Scotty, Scott Treeman. He said, yeah, he said, uh, he's my section leader or something like that. He went through here yesterday. So I missed my cousin by one day on Johnson Island in the middle of the Pacific. Well, we went to Pearl Harbor, and uh, then at Pearl, I met Joe McClellan, who had, I mentioned, who from Perry had gone to Iowa State, and Joe was a uh, material officer for the Army Air Corps in on Pearl Harbor. And we spent a couple of days there, and then I finally got a ship. I was supposed to fly out of Pearl, but it had fogged in, and there was such a backlog of senior officers that I had to come back by ship, which was a miserable trip. I had a bunk next to the, to, I think, a crooked drive shaft, <laughs> a <color laughs> shaft that beat me to death all the way home. Anyway, it was awfully good to get home. Well, then, uh, I met my wife, who I hadn't seen for two years, in Oklahoma City. And then we went up to Perry and spent a few days with the folks, and then I reported back into Melville and was personnel officer at the Melville station, and that was a hell of a job because then there was a tremendous, there was a tremendous turnover, and um, the, although the point system of discharge hadn't started, there was there were far more people involved than you needed, and the replacement the the replacement selection and most guys didn't want to go back overseas, which was understandable. And so, being in such a personnel officer, you got kicked both ways. And uh, as soon as I could, I got assigned to a new squadron, which was being commissioned in New York. And I had a little extra pull being personnel. I was I was not personnel officer for the I was the assistant, one of two assistant personnel officers. A fellow named Goodwin was the actual personnel officer. And um, I worked in Boston for a while. I went up to the Fargo building, which was a receiving station. And, and worked what period is this? Now this was in late forty five okay. or mid forty five. This is uh, I went to the new squadron. And on, we were in New York City on both VE Day and VJ Day. Tell me about those days. Well, those were, those were great days. I mean, uh, of course, we were, Mac had, uh, we, well, okay, uh, I came back and I was in the assistant, I was in the personnel office there, where we, we reassigned personnel to the Pacific and replaced them all over the world, wherever there were PT squadrons for replacement. It was, a, it was the receiving station for all personnel. 
uh, we were not responsible for officer. officer all officer order, orders came out of Washington. Now, was, we could make recommendations to Washington, but the orders themselves originated in Washington. We originated all uh, enlisted personnel. So, uh, like I say, when I got, I wanted to be in a new squadron, but I didn't want to go overseas right away. Maxine was pregnant. Uh, we were expecting a baby sometime around the first of year, which would have been in 46. Uh, actually, the baby was born premature. We, the baby was born in October, of, the end of October of 45. Um, so I got into this new squadron, which was RON 42. Uh, and was with it when it was commissioned. And but the squadron never did get a full complement of boats because of the end of the war. We we had six boats at the time it was commissioned, but they never did. They cut back on the contracts as soon as VE Day hit, and by the time VJ Day came, there was no. Tell me about VE Day, New York. New York, well, it was it was it was it was probably the best control riot I ever saw. It wasn't a riot, really. It was. Uh, it was just. It was just a million people on Times Square, and we were down there. Very orderly. Very. I mean, happy. It was happy people. There wasn't anything. You couldn't go. In other words, when you got in a line, you got in a group of people. You went with them. Everything was moving. You, you got here. You went that way. To, go this way you had to get clear across the street maybe or in the middle of the street. It was just wall-to-wall -wall people. Uh, it was a very sober crowd. Uh, we, uh, I forget whether it was VE Day was the same way. We were there for both of them. We lived in Brooklyn we, because of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We lived off of Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. Just I think a block off by Bush Avenue. And it was probably a mile and a half, two miles to the Navy Yard. But um, I remember we walked home. We, w we took the subway home. I want to get Mac here to tell me for sure whether that was on. I believe it was V. I believe that was VJ Day. We walked home at night, about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, and we were walking up the middle of Flatbush Avenue. Of course, there was very little traffic in those days because people didn't have a gas and they weren't out riding around like we do now. And uh, no, it was not Flatbush. It was a block off of Flatbush. We were walking up the middle of the street. In this area, you know, you wouldn't walk at night now without police escort. But then you felt completely comfortable. There wasn't any problems that we had with street violence. And. Uh, Coming down in the middle of the street meeting us was a little old woman with a handkerchief, and she would flip it. Say, hooray! As about as loud as she said, hooray! The war is over. <laughs> and we remember that. That's our favorite. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a it was a very orderly crowd, but millions of people. I mean, there were just people everywhere. People were people were happy. How does VE and VJ Day compare? They well, I the think same. they were very much the same. Yeah, of course, Navy wise. Uh, VJ Day was probably more of a more of a victory for the Navy than v, VE Day because there was so much more Navy involved. Uh, the Navy was basically Pacific. Uh, there was a lot of Navy in the Atlantic. I mean, but but it wasn't the glamour Navy. It wasn't the aircraft Navy, the aircraft carrier, the fighter, the all of this. This was this was the Pacific War, and there was a difference in the war. The the European war involved more, there was more um, international forces involved in the, in, the, in the Pacific. We felt like it was almost a, a, you know, a United States war, uh, an American war. And uh, I'm sure that there was a, I mean, I'm not saying that the Pacific takes credit because those guys in the Atlantic had a hell of, they had a hell of a worse environment to live in than we did. But at the same time, uh, and you, you tend to look at it from your point of view, too, I think. But the Navy, I think, the people I knew, and of course all the people I was involved with while I was in the Navy were PT people. 
I was never involved with anybody else except in the Fargo, no, in the uh, administration building in uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, I went back into personnel, of course, at, at, in the RON 42 because of my experience. I was in the personnel officer of RON 42. And in the uh, building there, they had, they then, that's towards the end of the war, we went to the point system in discharge. And this involved quite a bit of calculation as to how many months you had here and how many points you got. And it was, everybody knew their own points, but when you had uh, 300 men that you were trying to figure points and get a fair and equal, as a personnel officer, it was a different thing. So that uh, I was fortunate in having experienced uh, my Yeoman and the people that I had working for me were experienced and probably one or two of them were far more uh, informed than I was because they had been in personnel work for years in the Navy. I had one then I had one chief yeoman that was, was beautiful. He was just he just knew everything. He had been a yeoman for twenty two years, I think, in the Navy. So he knew and he was good at what he did. And of course like a lot of officers who were not trained for that you had to have the enlisted personnel that were your, I mean, they, they, they carried the ball for you. When did you get your discharge? I got my discharge on the, right at the first of the year. It was about the 3rd of January in 46. Um, I was a Lieutenant J.G. I, they, you went on what they call terminal leave then. You were given so many days leave. I had about 20 days terminal leave. Well, I was term on terminal leave after I had actually been discharged, was on terminal leave. The all-nav came through, which was a promotional thing, which made me a full lieutenant. And although I never did receive on my Navy discharge and everything, I still show as a JG, I was eligible. I wrote to the ninth, to the 8th Naval District after I was discharged and I found out about it. I didn't know about it at the time. I wrote and asked that they assign me the lieutenant, but it was never done to the office in New Orleans. It didn't bother me particularly because I didn't intend to go back in the Navy, but uh, I would discharge a JG, but I felt that I should have been qualified as a full lieutenant. What did you do after the war? We moved. First of all, I went to work for the state of Oklahoma uh, in the capital uh, as the information and education off, uh, officer, or education uh, forester. And I traveled the state. And at the time, Glenn Durrell, who was later director of forestry at OSU, was the director of forestry for the state. This was during the time that it was the Oklahoma Planning and Resources Board, Division of Forestry and State Parks. So I went to work uh, for Glenn as his information. I traveled all over the state as a, with a projector and a movie with a, with a story about forest fires, planting shelter belts, and this sort of thing. Uh, had I been, had I not had the long intervening years between graduation and employment in forestry, my desire at the time I graduated was to get into the forest service. But when I came out, I, we had the baby and uh, had a you know, little boy and uh, the responsibility, plus the fact that the civil service exam was probably I'd had to go back to school for another year or two to just to brush up to be qualified to take the civil service exam. Um, I don't resent ever having not done it, but that was my original objective was into the Forest Service, and I'm sure it would have been very interesting. How long have you worked for the Forest I worked for the state. I first took over as I and E forester. Then a fellow named Bob Garo, who was the head of the forest, who was head of the nursery, got a job with Dirks Lumber Company. That was prior to Warehouse being in the southeast, <coughs> Warehouser. So um, when Bob went down there, they needed to, they needed someone to run the state nursery, which was then located at Goldsby, south of Norman, which was a, an airport that had been taken over from. Navy it's a square still mile. There. Yeah, the nursery is still there, although some of that land I understand has been transferred to other things. At that time, when we took it over, and I was there at the transfer, the transfer was to, uh, under the stipulation we maintained the airstrip, 
we could use whatever we needed for the nursery on the east side of the property of that section, but then the west had to be maintained. We had to mow it and keep it as an auxiliary airstrip, which we did. And uh, at the time we moved in, there were no residents there. The state didn't have any money. Uh, there was quite a bit of, excuse me, quite a bit of hard feeling among the people who the land had been condemned for that by the Navy, that the Navy didn't let it revert back to them, rather it gave it to the state. But the reason was they want to maintain it as an airstrip. That was the Navy, or the government's idea. So that there were people down there that resented this thing of the state getting it for a nursery, and which was putting it back into sort of an agricultural enterprise. We took my first project down there was taking the old control tower, which was a two-story uh, building, not very large, although it looked pretty large to me then, and converting it into our residence. And uh, we used the downstairs for the kitchen and bathroom, and the upstairs we made into bedrooms. And my wife was from Iowa, and Maxine, and had, had never experienced Oklahoma winds and storms in the spring. So we moved into this in the spring. The top of it was nothing but glass clear around. On the second story, you looked right up the Canadian River towards Oklahoma City. Any time a wind came up over 30 miles an hour, it stirred up a dust storm off the Canadian River which blew down, and it would spook her. But there was a couple of times that she deserved to be spooked. I won't say deserved, but was uh, spooked and justifiably took uh, caution because there was a pretty good wind storm. Well, we lived there for a year, and I was in charge of the nursery. Well, then, uh, this was after a year of serving as the INE forestry. And I enjoyed the INE forestry because it was... What's INE? That's information education. And that was a designation that was... That was sort of a forest service designation. Uh, all over the United States, there were the INE foresters. That was the information education. Uh, but it meant a lot of time away from home. In other words, it was, you were gone 50% of the time, and I didn't, and you were traveling a lot. And uh, you also put, were responsible for press releases. And so, uh, like I said, I enjoyed it because I got acquainted with a lot of the state. And uh, I didn't, you weren't in it long enough to get no people, but you, you got acquainted with the area of the state. And I traveled from Cimarron County to McCurtain County and every place in between. And I've always appreciated that since I've lived here all my life. Since then, I felt I've known the state better than a lot of people, or better than I would have. I hadn't had that opportunity. Um, in, the, in the nursery, uh, I decided then, after I'd been in it a year, that I wanted to go into private business. And uh, with Glenn Durrell's blessing, in the meantime, I had trained, I say I had trained Al Engstrom, who was also an assistant forester and a very good man. And Al had, we had pretty well indoctrinated one of the fellows that was working down there to where he could do the work. And prior to that, all during the war, the nursery had been at Stringtown, and the laborer, Bob Gero, who was the nurseryman, had worked with the uh, trusty labor down there. And when we moved it, uh, we moved it from Stringtown to Norman, and uh, Bob helped with that. He was, uh, he stayed with the state until the move was completed as far as the equipment, because he knew it before he went to work with uh, Dirk's Lumber Company. Uh, I had a, I have a tremendous respect. I, Whether your opinion of Glenn would have been the same as mine or not, but uh, yes. I think yes. Glenn was the smartest man. I think he was actually the smartest man I ever ran into. Well, that what impressed me about him is that my summer camp was in Tom, Oklahoma. Your what? Uh, my summer camp in Forestry was Tom, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. 
down in far southeast of Kirkland County, mm -hmm. far southeast you can go in Oklahoma, because mm -hmm. it's three miles from Texas, six miles from Arkansas. And everywhere we went, we saw the respect that people had for Glenn. And so I knew that he was good from the respect, and these people have been in forestry for 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. and the respect they had for him. So I knew that he was good from that. And he was a good instructor too. Well, he, uh, of course he, what you were, you were asking about Dr. Bennett a while ago. And Dr. Bennett, while I was with the state, Glenn said, he said that he would stay as state forester until they separated state parks from the Division of Forestry. And when I went to work, it was Division of Forestry and state parks. And there was a political, it was actually the people uh, at Ardmore, they wanted the Lake Murray State Lodge. Glenn was violently opposed to, to putting on any state property parks particularly, anything that would eliminate the potential for the average man to enjoy it. And his feeling was, the minute you build a lodge, you're discriminating against the guy down here with four kids and a minimum income who camps out by putting in a golf course in a lodge that caters strictly to the people who can't afford it. And so his, his idea was you keep minimum facilities. They had some cabins. I believe they had so just, just basic cabins. You bring your own sheets and all of this. You don't, uh, no maid serves anything like that. You rent them by the day cabin. And they had those at two or three of the lodges, or state parks. Yeah. Well, he, Dr. Bennett came to him and said, I will not put in a school of forestry until you agree we're not taking picture now. Still no. no. Uh, I don't think you're recording. Mm -hmm. Are you recording now? Well, I hope I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Come on in if you want. Come on in, honey. Well, anyway, Dr. Bennett came to Glenn, and I'm quite sure that this is correct, although I wasn't present at the yeah. time, but told him he would not put in a school of forestry until Glenn would come and uh, take over as the dean of the school of forestry. He wanted somebody, he wanted Glenn to establish a school to get the personnel together for him. So uh, the guys at Ardmore, they kept forcing this issue of a, of a state lodge and they finally decided the only way they could do it because Glenn actually had outmaneuvered them. If you really want to get down to it, he had outmaneuvered the politicians and Glenn was anything but uh, a politician, I mean, as far as taking partisan sides in a political issue. Uh, they decided the only way to do it was get it legislatively, divide the state parks into a separate division, which they eventually did, and that was when Glenn quit. And that was only shortly before I quit, and that would have been in about uh, uh, 48 or 40, 47 or 48. But uh, when I say I think uh, I, I I think Glenn, I, as far as dealing with young people, maybe this is where Glenn was superior because he certainly knew how to he certainly knew how to handle he certainly knew how to handle fellows and teach them their jobs, and uh, he had everybody that worked for him, like you say, were were very loyal to Glenn. I mean, but I actually I've seen this, and I I was amazed. I mean. Bill Mitchell at that time was head of the, the fire the fire division in Broken Bow, and Bill had been with the division of forestry for a good many years, and he was a rather debonair type person and good quail hunter, and he got along real well with the, the people in the division. But uh, when I back in '46, when you went to Broken Bow, you stayed in a hotel, and I can't tell you a whole lot about it. I mean, my memory is not that good, except they had, they served meals family style, and they had the best food you ever saw, and especially somebody who had been out in the woods all day and was hungry. And there were quite a few log buyers and pole buyers and people like that that stayed at the hotel uh, who were in the area uh, buying up material. It was also the headquarters for the Dirks people when they came to Broken Bow. 
and I believe it was uh, Mr. Fred Dirks. I met a couple of them when I was there. But Glenn and Mr. F and Fred Dirks, or the, the Dirks who was in charge of the land management of the company down in that area, would sit down and we would talk, just as we're talking here in sections and by numbers and everything else, with that whole area. And I, I mean, it was in inconceivable that those guys could have as complete a knowledge of that whole the whole area. They'd spend the whole evening sitting down there talking about this and about the knob over there on that one and this and that. And of course, Dirks at that time in the 40s, in the late 40s, was doing a lot of land trading. They were trading, trying to block up into solid blocks. So there was quite a bit of interest. But Glenn was able to do that right along with Fred Dirks. And Fred and Dirks himself was, a, as far as I'm concerned, was a, almost unbelievable in the way he could. He knew he the property down there. Most of us have a little piece of property. We can't remember the legal description of <laughs> one piece. <laughs> but they were able to do it, and I always, I, I just sit around and admire or, or wondered about it. So you worked for the uh, state and forestry department for how many years? For two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. Then what did you do? Then I went to work for Baker Brothers Nursery in West Texas, in Lubbock, Texas. And this was in private. This is what I decided to do, was go into do private business. And I worked in their nursery down there for uh, one season, and then came to Lawton and put in my own nursery. And unfortunately, I had a rather tough time. I didn't, uh, I mean, I uh, didn't go broke in Lawton, but I hit the driest years he ever had, and I couldn't grow, I couldn't do the things that I wanted to. And Lawton's a lousy place to try to grow trees. And uh, I couldn't get the land I wanted, and it was strictly retail, and it was a lot of what I didn't really want. What I wanted to do was grow, and I just made a bad guess with all. And we hit the driest years there, and then we left Lawton in '40 in '53, uh, and I bought the hardware store here in Sepulveda, and we've been here since. And then I retired oh, about eight years ago. Not that long. I've been retired eight years. Yeah, about eight years. And, uh, but, uh, was it the Freeman Hardware Store? No, it was a Creek County Hardware Store. Creek and County. it was a, an old original store here. It was, uh, fact is, it was the original, it was probably, I won't say it was the oldest store. I think it was the oldest existing business in town at the time I bought it. Um, it was originally the Union Hardware Company, and the Union Hardware was a forerunner of the Gates Hardware and Supply, which is a wholesale, rather large wholesale Tulsa hardware store that's been there for a good many years. In 1919, the day I, the year I was born, a fellow named Emmett Matthews, who had a hardware in Kellyville, bought Gates out, and Gates moved to Tulsa into the wholesale business. They had been a retail wholesale up to that time. Um, go, go, go. I was going to ask, can you tell me why Tulsa got the oil business and railroads from Sepulveda? Uh, sure. It was greediness on the part of the people in Sepulveda. I mean, there wasn't any, I won't say primarily the oil business, but the railroads. And the railroads, of course the oil business had already, before Sepulveda lost the railroads, Sepulveda lost railroads in the early 20s. The oil business was already established in Tulsa prior to that. Um, there, there are there are elements in Oak and in Creek County, in Creek County's past that, and I say this, uh, recognizing that it's in the past. I don't, in other words, the, the fact that oil was discovered here primarily on Indian land led to a big uh, influx of every kind of grafter, lawyer, everything in the world came into Sepulpa. And their idea to get rich, the idea to get rich off the end. Now I think, I don't know if this is the reason, I don't know, I don't think anyone can give you an exact reason why the oil business ended up in Tulsa. But I wouldn't be surprised but what that had a con 
quite a bit to do with it. And we had an element in Sepulpa, in, in the Creek County, I won't say Creek County as not identifying it definitely with Sepulpa, whose, who's, I feel, whose uh, attempt was, and I'm not saying that it, uh, there was anything that was basically illegal, although it sure, it sure skirted legality all the way around to take advantage of the indigent Indian, of the Indian who was not able to make uh, uh, rational decisions in view of the, of the times. So that you have this element, and I, I, the railroad left primarily because of greed, and, it, and it, it's a well-known story in, in support of the, the reason the railroad I was not here at the time, but it had been told by, to me by enough people, the old timers, who are scarce now. But uh, when I first came, and I heard. say greed. What? Well, what happened? The railroad, the Santa Fe Railroad, came. City-owned property west of town, where the golf course is now, and then even on west, where the, where the water plant is along uh, uh, Rock Creek. The railroad came and they wanted the city to make them a legitimate offer so they could extend their yards into that area. They needed expansion. They had a big development uh, in, on, the south side, on the north side of town. Uh, I mean, they had a roundhouse, they had big repair shed. You see pictures of the city and it, in those days, in fact, I had one that I gave to Chamber of Commerce which was a panoramic view, which showed a great deal of all of the, all of the yards, the, the multiple tracks, everything. The president of uh, the the Frisco came, and they said we would like to uh, we would like to get the, the area west of town, make us a legitimate offer. I don't know who the mayor was. I don't know who was involved, but there were people involved uh, in official positions who heard about it, who immediately got options from the city for that land. Uh, I don't know exactly how they did. I don't know this the, the, the technical part, but I do know that this was, this was true and this was what took place. Um, these people got it and they put a fancy price on it. And the Frisco Railroad said, this is too much. We can't pay this. This is, you're, you're, cutting, you're cutting our throats on this. So the, the, the mayor and these people said, you can't afford to move. So the president of the Frisco Railroad and it called a meeting on the city park lawn, and this must have been, uh, I, I think, in 23 or 24. And the, the city was there. I mean, the people met there, and the president of the Frisco Railroad got up and told the whole story. He said, we want to expand here. We uh, engineers and, and repair personnel, all the people lived here. Uh, they didn't want to move, but the city owns the land out there and people have option on it and we've got to do something and we're going to do it. And uh, the, the mayor got up or whoever was spokesman for that group got up and said, well, the Frisco Railroad can't afford to move. They've got a roundhouse here. They've got all these buildings. There's no way they can, they've got to pay our price. Nobody's going to dictate to us what, what we can do, especially a railroad. Uh, the railroad gave, I don't know, a, a definite day limit, time ultimatum. Uh, the night that that expired at midnight, I think. But anyway, every section, every man was available anywhere they could get here was brought in by the Frisco Railroad. And overnight, Frisco Railroad disappeared from Sepulpa. They moved the roundhouse, they moved the building. In the meantime, they had an offer from West Tulsa or Sand Springs or somewhere in that area. I don't know who made the offer. They had the location. They moved it out of Sepulpa overnight. And it was there, and this is the reason I say it was Greek. It was their own fault. They, Sepulpa lost. I don't know whether it would have been a great addition, I think probably. So Papa went into a depression three or four years before the 29 crash. It was already in depression because it had lost Frisco Railroad. And it, uh, it was just the fact that there was a bullheadedness on the part of the people in the town. Uh, it's not what you call a pretty story, particularly now when everybody's trying to get something, but that was that basically what happened. 
I don't know why we lost the oil, but I do know that uh, that of course some of the injustices that I talked about were perpetrated by Indians on Indians too. I mean, it wasn't oh, all sure. that it wasn't. Uh, I heard that old timers in Tulsa I've interviewed was that Sepulta did not have a good hotel that Tulsa did. So well, when the oil men came to the area, they stayed in hotels in Tulsa, not Sepulta. That's, that's just possible, although Sepulpa did have good hotels fairly soon. They had the St. James and the uh, Commercial Hotel. They had they had several pretty good hotels during the oil during the oil boom. Yeah. But uh, I I would be more inclined to think that oil people, and especially those those guys that were dealing in, those were dealers. I mean, you take the the Gettys and the Sinclairs and all those guys were dealers, and then there were an awful lot of people that came in who who were, you know, who were lease brokers and things like this. They were smaller people, but they still were pretty good sized dwell people. And they wanted a freedom there that they I don't think they felt they had here. I don't think I think that there was too much control over here by this this same type of element. Politically, I know. I mean, politically, this 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 county has been. I'm I'm, I was Republican county chairman for a while, so I have traveled the county pretty well and have got some pretty good views. And when I came, I I don't think it's nearly like it was now. But politically, when I came, it was a, uh, and the years prior to that, it was pretty much of a of a dictated, run, fiefdom as far as that goes for certain individuals in, in the Democrat Party, and it was 100 percent Democrat. Uh, there's, there hasn't been, since I've been here, there hasn't been an elected county official who was Republican, uh, elected by the, the people. So that, I mean, I, and back prior to that, prior in the 20s and in the early, in the early, in the late teens, uh, I think Sepulpa at that time was primarily Republican. There were a great many people from Pennsylvania, the early oil people that came in here were from Pennsylvania and that area, they were primarily conservative Republican. They moved out. Uh, these other the other people that remained were Democrats. So that it was they lost their they lost it primarily by migration. I yeah. think the Republicans lost it. I have one last question. I'd like to get just I guess life and a PT vote. Just how did how did you live, eat, whatever. <laughs> well, I, like I tell you, when you were in when you were in a naval area. Uh, in other words, when we were in the United States and uh, basically at naval operated bases, you lived pretty good. You had you had a cook. Uh, as an officer, I had some prerogatives that the enlisted personnel did. In other words, whenever we got to a base that uh, was naval run, I could go to an officer's club and have what you might say private meal as compared to Navy meal. It would be Navy food, you paid for it, but you would be getting good food. The living conditions were very primitive. Uh, you didn't have water, you didn't have water producing facilities, so you had to get whatever water you could get. Primarily we got water uh, in a lot of the islands, you couldn't drill fresh water. So you had evaporating <coughs> devices and you got a sort of a salty uh, I don't know what you'd call it, water. Uh, you bathed primarily in seawater most of the time. It was quite a, once in a while, <coughs> you, now as officers we had a little better chance in enlisted personnel, although later in the war when there was more of the evaporators, the enlisted personnel were able to get into showers too. So that we would, any time we hit Land base, we try to get fresh water showers. That was that was a luxury. <coughs> uh, we did not live in the jungle. Now, on on Bougainville, particularly, you had a chance to make a comparison because I had people that we had gotten acquainted with who lived in the jungle, and these were army people. Uh, I never was closely associated with any of the Marine divisions. Uh, the first Marine division was on Guadalcanal, and they came on to Bougainville. But they were used primarily as assault forces and then would be transferred off to other places. 
the third Marine Division, I believe it was, came in at one time. <clears throat> but I didn't get acquainted with them. We didn't. Our only operational was maybe that we'd get an order to take some of them on, an, on some sort of a story that they would go inland. Uh, some, uh, we'd take them up the beach 15 miles and drop them off. They would go in maybe two or three days. You'd go back in and pick them up. <clears throat> this was this was strictly so. My comparison of living was with the Americal Division, where I had gotten acquainted, which was the closest division to our anchorage on Boone. And we were eating the same food, except we could move food. Anytime any sort of a Navy supply ship or destroyer came up, we would go out and move food. So we did have a chance to get food the Army did. And uh, then ordinarily, we got out to a destroyer, they would invite personnel aboard. You'd go up and meet with them maybe for a meal. To, I mean, this was this was like being in hell. Um, medical facilities, I think, probably were pretty good. Uh, we, uh, anyone who was badly injured, was immediately shipped down. There. Now uh, we had the exact officer. We lost the exact officer on my boat after he was transferred off my boat. He came on as third man on our boat, and we trained him as a, to take over as an executive officer. Then he went to another boat and uh, was burned very severely in an action and came up. And the last time I saw him, he was in a dugout uh, on Bougainville. Of course, Bougainville was shelled practically every night. I mean, it, it was indiscriminate shelling. It is, Japs would throw ten rounds, maybe or something. But everything was below ground, and especially the hospital. So it was a dug hospital with a tent cover. You went down steps into it, and then there was a tent over. And um, this fellow, name was Kent, was down there. And then, but as soon as they could get air transportation, they moved him back down to Guadalcanal, where there was a base hospital. And unfortunately, he passed away. Um, I, w I, 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 of course, the thing, the thing is that, like I said earlier, uh, in any war, and you know this, having been, any war, it's ten minutes of fighting and six days away, and this is the way it is. So that the living, and when you're in the jungle, it, there really isn't any. You, you don't get away from. You got to sit, and you're going to be there, and it's hot, maybe, and humid, and all of this. Uh, I I don't know. I have, I have a boy that was in Vietnam. My boy Jeff was over there for almost two years. He went to Cambodia with the invasion there. Or that group that went into Cambodia. Um, we've talked about it some. Uh, I I don't know where all of the gripe comes from the Vietnam. Veterans. I mean, there should have been a hell of enough to work from the, the guys who were in the South Pacific, as far as I'm concerned. I've never understood why there's so much uproar from Vietnam and not having an uproar from the South Pacific. It just doesn't just. I would go over to the Americal Division to those fellows there that had been up in the trenches for four or five days, and they had also served on, on Guadalcanal. So it wasn't as though they were just fresh recruits brought into Bougainville. And some of those guys would have jungle rot on their feet to where their feet would be swollen so large they would have them up on verandas trying to get the swelling and, and uh, you know, get the pain out of them. And yet, as soon as they would get down to where they were getting back to normal, it was necessary for them to go back up. So it was just a constant rotation of getting it, coming back, curing it, getting back, going back. Uh, they never did get back. And I, I mean, I've thought about some of those guys since then. We were fortunate. We got, we had jungle rock, which was a fungus that would get on your body. And it was, you, I think I still, I, I'm inclined to, I think you get it in your body once you never get rid of it. But uh, we didn't have the problem there because we were out on a good deck. It was, maybe we'd be wet all night and cold all night, but the next day we dried out. In a, in a wet trench, you don't do that in, a, in, a, in a, whatever you sit in if you're in the infantry or like those guys. Uh, we had a lot of interesting experience. We we dealt with the Fiji Islanders, with those guys, and with things that happened there. And I've talked to people since then that have been acquainted with some of their things, and it was just fabulous. As far as living, 
We wore, we didn't, I don't think probably the whole time I was in Ireland I got in dresses, dress clothes. I had one set of khakis, I believe. I didn't take any blues there or any, I may have had a set of whites on board. Uh, I don't remember ever dressing in whites for any occasion. Uh, they would issue us army shoes, which was, a, which was an outside rough leather shoe, which we immediately cut down into sandals because primarily what we wanted was something to dry out and would drink. So we would take maybe a $25 or whatever it cost, a high-priced pair of army combat shoes and immediately cut them down to sandals, cut out everything except the sole and enough leather to hold them on. We wore shorts. We went without shirts practically all the time. Um, if we slept on an onboard boat, we never had problems with mosquitoes. Now, on the Russell Islands, we were pulled into the beach. We had to pull in and uh, camouflage our boats under under the tree. Now, actually, we did not have an air raid. I, we had one air battle over. Some Japs tried to come down one time, and there was one air battle over. But we never had an air raid as such on us. So that really maybe it wasn't necessary, but there really wasn't any good way to act. Uh, but then you did have sleep under mosquito bars, and we were issued mosquito bars. There, the officers, all the officers lived, uh, as soon as we got there, we moved into a, a plantation, excuse me, a plantation house that we lived in. It was an old abandoned plantation house. And the only problem sleeping there was the fact that the rats were so thick that you had to use mosquito bars, not, I don't think much for mosquitoes, to keep the rats off. I mean, they were, it was one of those things that was just completely rat, the whole island was rat infested. Um, I think probably we survived on food. We ate an awful lot of dried food, dried eggs, dried potatoes, spam, all of this. I mean, that was, that was army fare, daily fare. I don't think we were, I, I never felt abused, I never, you know, I mean, I think, uh, I know that our living, uh, the food particularly, but probably not as good as it was on large ships, but the independence we had was far, far more important. We didn't have, we didn't have one-tenth of the, I mean, we were, we were just a bunch of kids having a great time in a way, and uh, uh, when we were in port, I mean, the guys could get out, walk the beach, go fishing, do what they wanted to. We didn't have the rigid discipline and, and the routine. We did have watches and this sort of thing. But if you weren't on watch, uh, there was always something to take you ashore, uh, watch whatever movies they had, or go do what you wanted to on the beach, which would, might be limited, but at least you were you were able to do as you, as you physically could do. So that. The, the freedom that we suffered there, I mean, that we suffered, the freedom we enjoyed there probably compensated for whatever, whatever we suffered there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have a good interview. <laughs> well, I've given you the names of these other people here in Oklahoma. I hope that you may have a chance if you get to yeah. contact those. I would, now, um, uh, I would suggest possibly contacting Bob Powers if you need, if you wanted more Oklahomans yeah. actually involved. Well, that's our purpose is Oklahomans in. In the, in the PT Boat Navy. Yeah. Well, oh, our, our, his, our theme is the history of Oklahoma. I see, okay. But uh, mm -hmm. we're covering World War II and uh, uh, PT boats and tank destroyers, the two units that you were, were short lived in. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they, were, they were gone. Well, uh, of course, the, P the PT boats will never be back in naval forces again. Yeah. They're not, uh, the closest thing you see are these Iran Iran Iranian gunboats that they're showing on TV right now, but against a modern destroyer, they're, they're mosquitoes. There's absolutely no way that they can be an effective force. A PT boat did a tremendous good at the time the forces, uh, we had lost what we had lost at Pearl Harbor and were unable to get forces to protect people we had on Guadalcanal. As it turned out, I don't think that at the time Guadalcanal was ever considered quite as strategically important as it actually turned out. Because actually, when MacArthur then came back with the, with the philosophy, the, the military philosophy that he followed, 
then the PT boat became, and the defense of the, of the Solomons became a primary concern because it was island hockey. You jumped from here to there and left everybody in between, let them, and as long as you could control the water in the air, you didn't care how many people were on the ground. And this is what we did, this is what we did when Rabal, the island I was thinking of, I mean the, the main base on New Ireland was Rabal. And this was heavily fortified, and we never did make a frontal assault on Rebal. It was it had been stupid. We didn't need to. We controlled the complete perimeter around it. You can let them sit there if you control that. And this was the reason for our base on Bougainville. And this is the reason PTs were important, was because they helped control the supply lanes that the Japs would have had to depend on to have an effective fighting force. And the only way they could get in on Bougainville when we left, the only way Japs, and they were doing it to a certain extent, the only way they could move, remove personnel from Bougainville was by submarine. And on two or three occasions when we would be going, I don't ever remember, we never did submarine. Uh, we carried depth charges, but we, we didn't have sonar equipment. But I can remember two or three times when we picked up submarines on radar. I am absolutely convinced they were submarines. You would start to make a run for them with the idea of, man, if I can get within a, maybe you'd pick them up two miles, and maybe if I can get within a mile, we'll, or half mile, we'll drop a torpedo. It would be just a random shot. You'd probably have one chance in hitting them like hitting a fly in a barn. But uh, before we ever would get in position to fire, the sub would submerge, which means that they would see us or pick us up on their radar. But they were removing people. I don't, they probably were bringing in some supplies but they were basically removing people. Uh, they had written Bougainville off. They were moving them, and so they had, they had a, a milk run between Rabal and, and Bougainville. And uh, I forget the name of the Jap general that was killed on Bougainville. At one time, Bougainville had one of the main air stations, which was neutralized. Uh, you may remember the story, the, the fighter planes picked up his transport plane, came in behind him and shot him down as he was landing. They didn't even know that our planes were in the area. And came down, shot him in the landing left without losing anybody. And it was somebody like Tojo, I believe, that they Was that Yamamoto? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I remember they went after Admiral Yamamoto. And they got his airplane. Well, this is this was basically okay. the one that they got was the one who was. I mean, they had found out. The Yamamoto was the one that was in charge of attacking Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the one. That, I think that's the one. Yeah, they, I yeah. think it is because uh, they were after him. They found where his airplane was, and they shot him. And they they were it was probably yeah. Yamamoto. Well, it was it was on Bougainville that this happened, yeah. but Rabal was within flight distance. And the only, we went over, we operated with black cats, and not, well, once in a long while you would talk to a black cat pilot. We didn't, uh, their bases were, art, were in fact, it was very seldom did we have black cats land at the, at the bay we were in on, on Bougainville. We had a rather poor anchorage, and they didn't like to put planes, they liked them to have them in, in you know, in a good anchorage. And we were on open, open water. We just had one small island that gave us any protection. Fortunately, we never did have bad storm on the way there. But uh, you get a high wind and you have to drag anchor. You always had an anchor watch at night. But anyway, uh, I don't remember when I talked to this pilot, but he was telling me they, they had, the, the Black Cat Squadrons, of course, were PBYs that flew patrol. And they operated with us. And uh, this one, do this one uh, fellow we were talking to was telling him about shooting down a Jap plane. They were the only, PBY, they thought at that time, or that had ever shot down a Jap plane. And what had happened, they were flying from New Ireland back to their base and just happened to look down, and here was the was a Jap plane, which was evidently a night courier between Rabal and uh, Bougainville, who was flying, they evidently flew them low, so they wouldn't be picked up on radar, who was flying right over water. These guys in those, those skin things looked down, saw this Jap, uh, radioed up to his pilot, hey, we got a Jap plane flying parallel to us right below us. They tipped it, the guy in the blister shot him down, and it was the only, and got a, made an ace out of himself without ever even getting in a dogfight. And that was, I think, the only time that any P-51 
PBY ever shot down, but they did that off of the tip of the line. But uh, the history of PD boats, there have been several written up, uh, not from the aspect maybe, you know, of Oklahoma participation. But unfortunately, uh, one of the things I think that restricted, particularly in the officer corps, was the fact that was the sailing experience in the early part of it, when there was probably more people really volunteering. And uh, this would have restricted people from Oklahoma because there were very few that had the, had, the, had any boating experience. And even though everybody in Oklahoma has got a boat now, uh, back then to have a boat with a motor on it was quite a, you know, I mean, that was definitely a luxury in the, in the 30s, there was very few. Well, Mr. Treeman? I want to thank you. I could talk another 10 hours. I'm <laughs> glad you didn't ask me to. <laughs>